It all started with a joke, one I'd heard a hundred times before. Yet, while standing at the entrance to the Shenandoah National Park, it somehow felt different, funnier perhaps. My name's Elias Rousen, and as an amateur wildlife photographer, I've always been drawn to the great outdoors. On this particular trip, I was accompanied by my close friend Nolan Sanwell. Hey, Elias, he chortled. Why don't you shoot something other than trees for once? Little did we know that his quip would soon take on a sinister meaning. The first day in the park was charmingly average. We walked the trails, admired the picturesque views and marveled at the sight of wild deer meandering among the lush flora. That night, we set up our tents in a designated camping spot near a cluster of dense trees. The following morning greeted us with a puzzling incident oddly placed scratches on some nearby trees and a lingering scent of wet fur. Nolan and I laughed it off as some nocturnal woodland creature marking its territory. But deep down, I couldn't shake that gut feeling something was amiss. By noon, we reached one of the park's renowned waterfalls. The powerful cascade echoed throughout its surroundings, creating a gentle roar. As my lens captured this majestic feature's every intricate detail, I heard an indisputable growl some distance behind me making me jump out of my skin. Uneasy, Nolan and I hastily decided to return to our campsite sooner than planned. En route, we stumbled upon campers Jenny Malton and Barrett Farnworth who informed us that their friend Jeremy had gone missing during an early morning fishing trip in a nearby stream. Their unease resonated with our own experiences, so after much consideration, we all agreed and formed park rangers about these occurrences as they seemed oddly interconnected. Just as we parted ways to search for help, we noticed several massive muddy footprints near another campsite all separated by far too great of a distance to be human. The insteps resembled enormous claws that had ominously gouged the earth beneath them. In that instant, a wave of primal fear swept over our small group. As Jenny and Barrett ventured east, Nolan and I turned west towards the ranger station. The footprints seemed to intermittently follow us forever lurking at the periphery of our vision. My heart pounded in my chest as the entire forest seemed to harbor a monstrous entity we couldn't quite wrap our heads around. Nearing the ranger station, our frantic pace slowed as we heard agonizing screams from the east the direction where Jenny and Barrett had gone. Our worst fears realized, we sprinted back, abandoning any plans to seek help from the rangers. The once picturesque forest now warped into an ominous sea of shadows engulfing my every step. Hurtling through dense foliage, we finally reached Jenny and Barrett with sheer disbelief plastered on their faces. Before us lay an unrecognizable mass Jeremy's mutilated body. Indescribable fear seized us as realization dawned. A creature beyond comprehension was making these woods its abattoir. Seized with adrenaline-induced resolve, we tactically attempted an escape by navigating only during daylight using a compass and park map. Though opinions argued for no cell phone reception restricting our call for help, deeper down emerged an unspoken notion. Perhaps technology couldn't save us this time. In broad daylight, on yet another trail trekking back towards safety, I noticed Nolan seemed disheveled his clothes torn. Face scratched as if attacked by enraged brambles. He denied any recollection of injury while maintaining a strained smile. Nobody dared press further. We reached an overlook where tension momentarily dissipated as we took in the breathtaking view. Laughing nervously about wishing for a simple bear encounter instead, suddenly, the ground beneath us shook as a nightmarish figure emerged from the depths of the forest. Its monstrous outline flickered in the shadows. Patches of mottled fur peppered its hulking form which appeared to shift and morph before our very eyes. A guttural growl emanated from within the beast's core echoing through our petrified bones. In sheer panic, 
we dispersed in different directions without any semblance of a logical plan. Dread encompassed rational thought. My heart raced as thorns from unseen branches pierced my skin while I stumbled over roots that seemed to deliberately hinder my escape. My legs carried me faster than they ever had, but I could hear the creature's snarls and growls echoing behind me. I knew my only hope was to keep running and hope that I would somehow lose it in the dense woods. Nearing a clearing, I spotted Sarah and Jake regrouping by a fallen tree. As I reached them, panting uncontrollably, we exchanged looks of pure terror. Without speaking, we urgently decided to find Nolan and leave the area as quickly as possible. We didn't care about recovering our belongings at this point. Survival was our only concern. During our search for Nolan, we stumbled upon a couple of hikers who looked pale and terrified. Questioning them for any information on the situation, one of them choked out a single name, Wendigo. They didn't elaborate further and hurriedly pushed past us. We finally found Nolan hiding in a grove of trees, his eyes wide with fear. Reunited, we made haste to leave the park by following a nearby river in hopes of reaching civilization. We noticed that none of us had any cell phone reception, which only added to the grim reality of our situation. We were entirely on our own. Along the way, we encountered other hikers scurrying through the woods with expressions of terror etched on their faces. They spoke in hushed tones about sightings of an enormous beast stalking the park, leaving only destruction in its path. We continued walking for hours on end trying to put as much distance between ourselves and the creature as possible. As night fell again, we stumbled into a small village just outside the park limits. We sought refuge in a local and where we hoped to be safe from the horrors lurking within the forest. The innkeeper welcomed us with warmth and concern radiating from his expression as he listened intently to our harrowing story. He shared tales of a monstrous beast known as the Wendigo, a creature from folklore believed to feast upon human flesh. The villagers had lived in fear of the Wendigo for generations, but the recent events had stirred an unprecedented panic. We spent a sleepless night at the inn, huddled together in a single room with the door securely locked. We knew that we had narrowly escaped the jaws of death, but we could no longer ignore the undeniable truth. There was something out there, hunting us. Dawn finally arrived, and we strategized our next step. A search party had been dispatched from the nearby town to investigate, but none of them ever returned. Desperate not to fall victim to rumors and fear any longer, we decided to leave the village and return home as quickly as possible. Before leaving, we spoke with other survivors at the inn, sharing every detail about our encounters with the Wendigo. We also learned of those who hadn't made it, two hikers who'd been brutally killed by the creature in their frantic attempts to escape. As we left the village behind and traveled further away from the park's confines, we couldn't shake off the unnerving sensation that something was still watching us. A cold shiver ran down my spine as I caught glimpses of mottled fur and sharp claws just beyond my peripheral vision, a chilling reminder that our horrifying ordeal was far from over. The four of us returned home with scars both physical and emotional from our terrifying encounter. Over time, stories trickled in about more terror-stricken campers fleeing the park and villagers continuing to live in fear of this legendary beast. Eventually, officials closed off access to the park indefinitely while investigations into the mysterious incidents began. Our lives would never be the same again after coming face to face with pure evil in its most primal form, known only by its whispered name, Wendigo. Last night, while walking in Glacier National Park, I couldn't shake this unsettling feeling. 
My name is Arnold Richter, and I work as a ranger in these parts. Now, I don't believe in supernatural mumbo-jumbo, but there's been talk of a grisly incident that happened recently a hiker, Bradley Roker, found dead, half-eaten. They said an animal was responsible. Little did I know that this information would soon take on a whole new meaning for me. During my patrol, I stumbled upon a broken tent near Flathead River. It belonged to Stephen Chalmers. I recognized his name from the records of people who signed up for camping reservations this week. The wreckage suggested that an animal had ravaged the area, but the claw marks on the trees were unlike any native creature. My partner Gina Lawrence and I started searching around for signs of Stephen when we heard a rustling in the bushes nearby. Gina? I whispered urgently. I found her crouching down inspecting something on the ground. Arnold, this looks like Stephen's shoe, she said gravely. We decided it was best to find him immediately. We called out his name as we followed tracks leading further into the woods tracks that matched no park animal we've ever seen. Night fell eerily fast and darkness enveloped the park like an unwanted blanket thrown over us. As we circled back towards a main trail to reevaluate our search, we saw a group of hikers staring at something on the ground ahead of us. We quickly ran to meet them and discovered they'd come across something gruesome, Bradley Roker's remains. Stay here! I ordered them and radioed back up. Gina suggested one of us return with them for their safety while the other continued searching for Stephen. I'll guide them back she said, handing me her flashlight. You're more familiar with this terrain, Arnold. I couldn't disagree. Moments after Gina and the hikers left, I heard distant screams followed by an inhumane growl that sent a shiver down my spine. Panicked, I lunged towards the noise, but they had all vanished without a trace. The only evidence was a scrap of clothing and a trail of blood leading deeper into the woods. I briefly considered calling for help but realized that I was in an area notorious for poor reception. Assuming that Stephen might still be alive, and now fearing for Gina and those hikers, I ventured onward. The tracks continued becoming uncanny with each step. Worried about Gina's safety, I decided it was time to reveal what was on my mind. Gina, this is no normal animal, I whispered to myself chuckling nervously at my strange dive into superstition. The moonlight revealed a small cave entrance up ahead. A horrifying stench wafted out of it like a slap to the face, and the pain in my nostrils served as an odious warning sign that turned out to be absolutely correct. For within lay a creature unlike any other, eight feet tall with razor-like teeth dripping blood a monster in every sense of the word. I managed to hide behind a set of rocks just as the creature emerged from the cave. My heart pounded so furiously I was sure it would give away my position. But luckily, it seemed preoccupied with something deeper in the forest. Making sure to keep some distance between us, I tailed the creature cautiously. Its relentless pace never wavered as it darted from tree to tree and sniffed at the air periodically. With every minute that passed... I worried more about its ultimate prey. As faint glimmers of daylight peeked through tree branches, we arrived at another gruesome scene, a man's dismembered arm precariously perched on a ledge. A man's unfortunate fate, destined to strike others too, if I didn't act fast. I knew I couldn't fight the creature, nor did I want answers about what it was or where it came from. It had already caused enough carnage for one night. As it continued to stalk through the forest, its claws ripping into tree bark as if a mere inconvenience, I decided now was the time to call for help. Using my mobile phone, I hastily dialed the emergency number. My voice shook as I explained what was happening, struggling to make my words coherent and believable. But when they asked about the creature and its appearance, my certainty wavered. This thing resembled something out of folklore— and even if I knew what it was called or where it came from, who would believe me? What authorities could deal with a monster like this? Despite my initial fears of being discredited, 
a park ranger team was dispatched and set to arrive just before dawn. As they made their way toward me, I backed away from where I had been following the creature. My mind raced as I struggled to compose myself. The hideous form of the beast lingered in my mind, for matted with dried blood, a snout filled with jagged teeth that could easily tear apart human flesh. Before long, a small group of individuals arrived at my position, armed and ready for action. They were supposed to protect us from such threats, but still, tension hung in the air as uncertainty gripped them. It was as if they realized, however insane my description had sounded over the phone, that something entirely too real now stood in front of them. Suddenly we heard an intense snapping noise tearing through the forest. A primeval roar followed that shook us all to our core. We looked at one another briefly before taking off towards the sound at a full sprint. The group didn't make much of an attempt to stay concealed now. We all knew this creature knew we were coming after it. When we finally arrived at the scene, the grotesque sight of another camper's body, which had been ripped apart and partially devoured by the monster, lay on the ground. The beast's eyes bore into us as it crouched over its meal. It wasn't just a clever hunter. It wanted us to know that we were its prey. Not giving an inch, the park rangers fired in unison at the creature. The sound of gunfire rang out, but despite registering numerous hits with their weapons, it didn't seem phased. Instead, it glared at us and appeared to grow even angrier. Knowing that we couldn't deal with this beast alone or through conventional means, we scrambled to retreat. I kept a close eye on the monster and saw that it lunged after us with surprising speed. Yet as it charged straight at me, I suddenly put two and two together and uttered aloud, It's got to be a Wendigo. The name seemed almost preposterous, something out of folklore, but everything clicked in that moment. As we continued to run, I kept thinking about how only fire could vanquish this beast, a bit of trivia I'd once heard in some spooky ghost story. We sprinted towards a nearby ranger station where large cans of gasoline were stored. While several stayed behind to help hold the monster off for a few precious seconds, I began dousing our surroundings in fuel. Then without hesitation, I pulled out my lighter and sparked up a massive flame. The Wendigo roared in pain as fire exploded all around us, its weakness now exposed. For a moment, it looked as if we had won, but then the creature bellowed again and charged straight into the inferno. The blaze continued to rage on for some time before finally dying down, the Wendigo left charred and defeated in its wake. Exhausted by our desperate struggle for survival, we mourned the lives of the unfortunate campers lost to such horrifying violence. As we walked away from that forest, a mixture of relief, sadness, and newfound knowledge weighed heavily upon me. Though I dreaded ever encountering another beast like this Wendigo again, my determination to save others from such a fate only grew stronger each day. I gripped the radio tightly, as sweat started forming on my palms. My name is Jonah Turner, a search and rescue officer for the United States Forest Service. On this particular mission, I was in Mono County, California, responding to an emergency report of gruesome animal attacks that had left three victims behind. Astonishing, I muttered to myself while standing at the edge of a clearing. Surrounding me were vast pine forests of inexplicable beauty interrupted with massive boulders. We were deep into Inyo National Forest serene, yet now seemingly sinister. The place sure doesn't kid around with scale, makes a human feel small. Soon after my arrival, I met Craig Thompson, the local ranger in charge of this area. He looked worse for wear severe bags under his eyes and thinning hair betraying that he'd not known sleep for some time now. You said the mutilations are unusual? I asked him as we walked towards a nearby cabin. Very, he responded gravely. 
It's like nothing I've ever seen. As we approached the scene of one attack, a sickening odor filled the air. The cabin's wooden door hung by a hinge, its once sturdy frame smashed and splintered. What kind of animal could have done this? I wondered aloud. Craig shook his head but didn't reply. He led me to a rock face near the cabin where we discovered one of the bodies that was twisted and contorted in an unnatural way that made me feel lightheaded. It seemed like whatever had attacked these people was almost toying with them before going in for the kill. My skepticism began to wane as we finished examining yet another dismembered body. Something about this situation just didn't add up. Still, my mind fought against wilder possibilities. Dismissing fears unknown to science always kept me sleeping better at night. As days turned into weeks, I slowly realized that this wouldn't be a regular search and rescue mission. When the mutilated animals started appearing alongside human remains, it became downright eerie. The creature was unlike any known wildlife. Its predatory tactics made even experts like me feel like we were experiencing an abnormal nightmare. Jonah, don't you think we should call for backup? Craig asked me one evening, his voice strained with fear and exhaustion. You really think we'll get fast backup all the way out here? I replied with a sad half-smile. Besides, whoever's out there has clearly been here longer than we have. My reply did little to decrease his anxiety. It probably just deepened it. But our options were few and precious what good would it do to scream for help in this remote landscape? Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. As the sun dipped over the horizon, bathing the forest in eerie twilight hues, Craig and I chose to set up camp early. We were exploring one of the most rugged areas of Inyo National Forest, trying to pick up any sign of our elusive quarry. Sitting around the campfire, we shared a couple of jokes to lighten the mood, a waning attempt at levity in times of despair. However, our laughter died as our thoughts spiraled back to the grim situation at hand. That night is one I'll never forget, my dreams disturbed by flashes of blood-soaked fur. But when I jolted awake just past midnight senses heightened but breathed ragged I knew that what lurked beyond my tent wasn't the stuff of nightmares. Then it happened. Craig's voice screamed my name from across the darkness. Desperation permeated through every syllable before it was abruptly cut short by a guttural growl straight from hell. Heart pounding so hard that it felt like breaking ribs, I scrambled out of my sleeping bag and grabbed for my gun, fingers fumbling in the fray. I stepped out of my tent and into chaos incarnate. The creature was colossal, an assemblage of gnarled limbs, unfathomable raw power, and glowing red eyes that seemed to burn holes into your soul. No folklore or nightmare had prepared me for such a sight. Its claws gouged deep swaths into the earth as it swung at Craig. I held my breath, trying to steady myself for the fight that seemed to transcend human understanding. My mind raced, searching for a solution. There's no point in screaming for help. We're too far from civilization. I glanced at my phone, no signal. Calling for help wasn't an option either. Craig was on the ground, struggling to get away from the monstrous creature. He looked at me with terror-filled eyes, a silent plea. I couldn't stand idly by while my friend suffered. Hey! I shouted, trying to attract the creature's attention. Over here! The creature turned its head towards me, its eyes ablaze. Allowing Craig to scramble to his feet, we both started running through the dark forest, hoping to find shelter or means of escape. It didn't take long before the relentless chase became exhausting. Craig stumbled over a tree root and hit the ground hard, letting out a groan of pain. Ignoring my aching muscles, I stopped to help him up. We can't outrun it. Craig panted and looked around frantically as we continued our sprint away from the monster. His face held a grim determination that mirrored my own. 
coming upon a massive tree that had fallen over months ago, and knowing there isn't much time remaining, Craig and I decided to hide in the hollow space underneath it. Crouching down low, we struggled to control our heavy breathing as the adrenaline surged throughout our bodies. We listened intently as the creature's guttural growls grew closer. The ground beneath us seemed to vibrate with each heavy step it took, its claws scraping against rocks and trees in its pursuit of us. Suddenly, an idea came to me. Craig, I whispered as quietly as possible. You remember those flares we brought along for emergencies? We could use them now. A glimmer of hope shone in Craig's eye. He nodded before digging into his backpack with shaky hands and pulled out two bright red flares. We held onto the flares, praying it would be enough to fight off the creature or at least scare it away. The monster's growls were escalating, just outside our hiding spot. In a single synchronized motion, Craig and I ignited the flares, casting a brilliant red light upon the grotesque creature, its twisted snarl a sight to behold. Its red eyes squinted from the brightness of the flares and let out an ear-splitting roar. Seeing this effect, we waved the flares wildly in front of it. The creature screamed in agony every time it got too close to the scorching light. It backed away slowly and then retreated into the forest, its hateful eyes never leaving ours as it disappeared back to wherever it came from. Letting out deep sighs of relief, Craig and I emerged from our hiding place, flares still flickering as they began to die out. We couldn't forget what had happened tonight nor could we forget those who had been victimized by that creature before us. Exhausted and terrified but alive, we made our way back to camp. Our destination became clear. Leave Inyo National Forest as fast as possible come morning, ensuring no one else would suffer such a horrific fate ever again. I stood waist-deep in the murky swamp, feeling the cold water seep into my boots. My name is Jasper Mancini, and I am a search and rescue officer for the United States Forest Service. Today, I had been called to Okafinoki Swamp, Georgia, to look for a missing tourist group that vanished without a trace. Earlier in my exploration, I stumbled upon a secluded shack deep within this vast wetland. It was rotting, crumbling, its once bright paint peeling and revealed only decaying wood beneath it. As I peered through the murky water surrounding the shack, I noticed an eerily large collection of rusty knives and firearms. Hey, do you know why fish don't have any meaningful conversations? I jokingly asked my colleague from afar. He arched an eyebrow, prompting me to reveal the punchline. Because they can't fathom it. We shared a brief chuckle before returning to our harrowing task at hand. As hours went by and no clues were found, a chilling wind brought with it the smell of rotten flesh. Disgusted but determined to locate our missing tourists, we pushed deeper into the Okafinoki's eerie depths. The forest seemed alive as its dark shadows danced around us. Suddenly, we heard a terrible scream echo in the distance. Cautiously, we followed it through the trees. My heart raced while we approached what appeared to be a massacre scene, shredded clothing strewn about among mangled bodies. The corpses all bore gnarled wounds that looked as if something had torn them apart with vicious claws. They were mauled beyond recognition. Blaring radio chatter suddenly pierced through the deafening silence. Jasper! Come in! It was our supervisor on patrol nearby. I grabbed my radio with trembling fingers. Go ahead, I whispered, pain clenched in my voice. I've spotted something strange on the radar. It looks like someone's moving fast toward your area. Be careful. I stood up, steadied my nerves, and scanning the surroundings, when I was abruptly tackled to the ground. A sharp, coarse breath filled my ear. Before I could get my bearings, I found myself in a life-or-death struggle with something inhuman, 
Its muscles rippled across its hulking form as I desperately tried to wrench free from its grip. Its body was covered in coarse, dark fur, and its eyes shone with a fearsome red glow. Its blood-drenched maw reeked of rotting flesh, and it let out a guttural growl. My heart hammered like never before. I had no doubt that this enigmatic creature was responsible for the carnage that we had stumbled upon. A gunshot rang through the air as my colleague undoubtedly aimed for the beast atop me. As it swerved out of harm's way, I fought to regain control of the situation and rid myself of this malicious grip. The creature roared and took a sudden swipe at both of us with its grotesque and monstrous claws, sending my comrade crashing through a nearby tree in a flurry of shattered bark. With no other choice, I kicked the creature in its gut, allowing me just enough time to scramble away from its grasp. My mind raced, searching for a way to escape this terrifying scenario. Jasper, you need to get out of there now! The voice on the radio repeated urgently. As fast as my legs could carry me, I sprinted through the dark forest. The sinister growls of the creature echoed behind me, growing closer with each passing second. Just as I thought I had gained some distance from the horrifying beast that was still relentlessly pursuing me, my foot caught on a hidden root and sent me plummeting to the forest floor. I heard heavy footsteps approach and forced myself back upright against a tree. In an instant, the imposing figure loomed over me with murderous intent in its glowing red eyes. My supervisor's voice crackled on the radio again. Jasper! Hang on! Backup is coming! Just then, a loud commotion echoed from behind the monstrous creature. Gunshots rang out as several of my fellow officers arrived and began firing at it en masse. The creature hissed violently in response to their barrage of bullets before taking one last swipe at my leg. Its sharp claws dug into my flesh like knives through butter, and blood gushed from the deep wound inflicted. With a roar that seemed to reverberate through every inch of my body, the beast retreated into the darkness of the forest. The sound of its howls slowly faded until all that could be heard was labored breathing, from both it and myself. The other officers rushed to my side. One applied pressure to slow the blood flow from my leg while another called for medevac support. My head spun, and black spots invaded my vision as I fought to remain conscious. What was that? I muttered through gritted teeth. We don't know one officer replied grimly. But we need to investigate and ensure this nightmare doesn't happen again. The medics finally arrived, and they loaded me onto a stretcher. As they carried me to the helicopter, my heart ached for my fallen colleague. I could only hope that the creature would be found and killed before it had the opportunity to harm anyone else. It took weeks before I could walk again, and by that time... The search for the creature had been called off. No traces were found despite extensive efforts, suggesting it had gone into hiding. For months afterward, the massacre haunted me. Relentless thoughts of my fallen comrade and that dreadful night dominated my every waking moment. But eventually, life forced me to move forward. Though I've since retired from active duty as an officer— I have devoted my life to helping others avoid similar tragedies by sharing my harrowing experience with them. I recount the tale with remorseful reverence for those who lost their lives that day but also with hope that someone out there might have knowledge of this bloodthirsty creature so we can somehow eliminate any trace of this abomination from our world. To this day, however, no further encounters with the creature have been reported, its whereabouts unknown perhaps biding its time before it strikes again. And so we wait, ever vigilant against its possible return lest the horrifying nightmare repeat itself and render other innocent victims to its monstrous appetite. I remember the day like it was yesterday 
despite the passing years that have blurred many other memories. My name is Clayton Arnell, and at that time, I was employed as a truck driver, responsible for delivering goods to various locations throughout the country. On this particular run, I found myself in a remote part of Nevada, where the mountains stood stoically in the distance and the roads were wide-open stretches of nothingness. As I drove along enjoying my freedom on the road and chuckling at a podcast about ludicrous laws in different countries, I noticed an old dirt path leading away from the main highway. It stretched into a hidden valley, which seemed like it hadn't been disturbed for years. The silhouette of an abandoned warehouse partially concealed by tall trees intrigued me enough to take a detour from my usual route. As my truck rumbled down the path toward the forsaken building, I glimpsed an eerily lifelike human figure lying on the ground amidst leaves and debris. Even though it looked gruesomely disturbing, curiosity fought back against my skepticism. Approaching cautiously, I realized it wasn't just some grotesque mannequin. This appeared to be a crime scene that had gone unnoticed until now. The atmosphere immediately shifted as a chilling gust of wind blew through my hair. Sensing something was off but unable to place exactly what, it became apparent that calling for help was not an option. There was no cell phone reception in this remote location. I felt unnerved but reluctantly decided to investigate further. Gathering every ounce of courage, I walked into the warehouse through a creaky metal door. Abandoned machinery and shattered glass coated the floor in their rusting embrace. A pungent odor of decaying materials filled the damp air around me. Feeling both alone and watched simultaneously, I tried to convince myself that everything was coincidental. Maybe this was just some long-lost crime scene. My bubble of self-delusion shattered when I heard the faint sounds of metal scraping against the ground. The distinct sound originated from a corner shrouded in darkness. Something was moving there, something with heavy and deliberate steps. With my heart pounding, I shone the truck's headlights into the interior of the warehouse. The beams penetrated the darkness. That's when I first saw him the hulking figure of a man slowly ambling toward me. His clothes were unkempt, one eye partially obscured by scruffy black hair. His massive hands covered in dried blood, cruel intentions written all over his face. Utterly frozen in my spot, I realized I had to escape fast or suffer a fate worse than any trucker's nightmare on the road. Fumbling for my keys, I turned on the engine and began reversing my truck away from this grotesque scene. The large figure did not give up so easily, gaining speed as he pursued my vehicle down the dirt path. The chase continued for what felt like hours. This silent predator relentlessly shadowed me like a malign spirit hungry for blood, leaving no opportunity to stop or call for help. Pinned between sheer terror and a foreign landscape devoid of human habitation, all I could do was keep driving, praying that sooner or later he would lose interest in me. The dirt road seemed to stretch endlessly in front of me as I pushed the pedal to the metal, trying to outrun the hulking figure relentlessly pursuing me. My truck's engine roared, giving its all to escape the monstrous man who seemed hell-bent on hunting me down. With my phone nowhere to be found, I had no way of contacting help. I cursed myself for having left it at the last truck stop. I was truly alone in this race against death. As time passed, shadows began to lengthen. The memories of broken bodies and dried blood continued to fill my mind as exhaustion began to gnaw at me. My hands ached from gripping the steering wheel tightly as every muscle in my body tensed preparing for what might come. Unforgiving asphalt road turned into smaller rural roads. Farmhouses and trailers occasionally spaced out between vast fields only added to my anxiety and fear of my quiet pursuer. Perhaps one of these homes housed a potential ally. Though inviting, I knew that stopping would spell doom for both myself and anyone who might attempt to help me. As darkness finally overtook the landscape, 
my gas gauge dipped perilously close to empty. Desperate but determined not to give in, I scoured the roadside for any sign of civilization, a gas station or even a rest stop where I could finally try and find help, or salvation. A flickering neon sign finally emerged from the distance. Gas and go. Relief washed over me as I pulled into the station. Though dimly lit and marked by age, it represented safety. As I filled up my tank, a lone attendant inside eyed me curiously through a grimy window. Perhaps he had some answers or suggestions on how to deal with this nightmare? Heeding caution not to involve an innocent stranger in my plight, I hurriedly paid for the gas without seeking help from him. Simply having human contact nearby calmed my nerves enough to help me think clearer. Realizing the obvious, I reported the nightmarish figure and my harrowing pursuit to the police, who promised they'd be on the lookout for my tormentor. Back on the road once more, the figure had seemingly faded into the darkness. Even so, I knew he would not give up his relentless pursuit. Hours passed as I continued to drive, not daring to stop even for a moment. Taking paths leading me further from the horrors of that warehouse seemed pointless, as every turn brought renewed fear of dreadful encounters. Eventually, my defensive approach paid off. The sinister maniac's presence diminished with each mile I put between us. My tormentor vanished into obscurity. The chase was finally over. Weary and shattered from the ordeal, I returned to civilization once more. However, scenes from that fateful night would haunt me for years to come, crumpled bodies left like discarded trash in a forsaken warehouse, the terror and pain in their lifeless eyes, and the remorseless monster responsible for it all. Emotionlessly, I returned to my job, now burdened with an unshakable weight on my conscience. The hulking figure came no closer to seeing justice for his atrocities. But I couldn't forget those he'd brutally taken from this world, innocent souls victimized by his sick desires. While the nightmare never returned in physical form, it remained embedded in my mind, reminding me of what true evil looks like, and how it walks among us, disguised in plain sight. Years have passed since that traumatic encounter. Whatever fate befell that monstrous pursuer remains unknown. Even today, when sleep eludes me, I fear he still lurks in our world, the darkness concealing his malevolence until he strikes again. I had been driving for what felt like an eternity. My name is Trenton Whalock, a truck driver who has seen his fair share of remote American highways. As my truck rumbled through the isolated stretch in Idaho, nothing but mountains and wilderness surrounding me, I yearned for a bit of human contact. Stopping at the only diner in miles that resided within these desolate mountains, I grabbed myself a steaming cup of coffee and exchanged pleasantries with patrons. An old man, Royce Galloway, jokingly mentioned how several locals claimed they'd seen someone lurking around the area, causing mischief as well as some grave concerns. We chuckled at the story like it was an urban legend, ghosts haunting abandoned Idaho landscape. As I got back out on the road, the sun began to dip behind the mountain peaks. The scenic route turned ominous with each passing mile where whispering trees seemed to keep growing numbers. In my headlights appeared an old banged-up vehicle that had been vandalized to the point I couldn't recognize its make or model. It lay abandoned and thoroughly defaced by fire next to an uprooted pine tree. Pulling my truck to a halt, I cautiously approached the wreckage with caution. The scene sent chills down my spine. Someone had truly gone overboard in their efforts to destroy this car almost as if it had been used as part of some ritualistic gore-fest. Soon enough, I noticed something else, footsteps leading away from the torched car and deeper into the woods. I couldn't shake off my intrigue as curiosity took hold of me, cautiously following those prints. 
as I ventured further into the wilderness, the eerie silence broken only by my heartbeat pounding in my ears. Until there was muffled cry, panicked voices whispered for help nearby leading me towards distressed strangers who had been bound and gagged next to a makeshift campsite from hell complete with shattered skulls surrounding a fire pit. My blood ran cold as ice realizing this wasn't just a harmless prank from some local folks something much more sinister lurking among those woods. Processing everything that had happened so far, including Royce Galloway's story, I realized I couldn't ignore this any longer. I couldn't call for help, as there was undeniably no cell service in this remote area. The thought nagged at me that I'm putting myself in danger by pursuing whoever caused these tragedies. Alternatively, leaving these hostages abandoned would eat away my conscience. Untying them as swiftly as possible, we pieced together our plans to navigate back to safety, avoiding any further confrontation with their tormentor. However, fate had other ideas as we briskly scampered back towards where I left my truck, the chilling sound of footsteps echoed behind us. The man causing havoc on this landscape made his unmistakable presence known his imposing stature relentlessly trailing our every move like a predator honing in on its prey. He flaunted a grotesquely contorted face and eyes that bore the hunger of an animalistic killer who reveled in his handiwork. My pulse raced as the relentless pursuit continued without a word ever uttered by the man, only motions resembling an ominous dance of death where he toyed his prey before making the fatal blow. Heart pounding in my chest now intensifying, creativity sprang into action, while my newfound companions outpaced me in their desperate attempt to escape. A risky plan crossed my mind, making an abrupt turn, barreling down a hill that led to a steep embankment edged with murky waters. The villain followed relentlessly, eyes gleaming with sadistic satisfaction evident from narrowed gaze despite our struggle towards salvation. With my plan in motion, I couldn't help but watch the horrifying display as the monstrous man lunged toward the murky waters. The combination of his momentum and the steepness of the hill led to his swift slip into the ominous liquid below. An unsettling concoction of relief and dread filled me as I observed his struggle in the engulfing muck. We have to keep moving, I urged the others, who looked similarly shaken by the scene which had just unfolded. We knew that even if our malicious stalker was temporarily incapacitated, time was of the essence. We had to escape this place before he emerged swearing vengeance, or before any more victims fell prey to his evil pursuits. As we guided ourselves through dense forestation with nothing but instinct to follow, our group of survivors traded fragmented memories, and while we tried to form connections between each other's stories— Every step felt uncertain. Among us, Royce Galloway recounted his account of when he joined our group from a position equally terrifying. To our surprise, hope revealed itself within the maze of nature. We stumbled upon a well-hidden trail, barely discernible tracks from what seemed like another vehicle that had been trod over by countless footsteps. The indication was faint but suggested it could return us back to society. Silence fell upon our party, only broken by occasional gasps as every sound jarred our nerves was at him. Had he returned? We knew it wouldn't be surprising if he reappeared, as determined as ever. But we had no choice but to press on or risk succumbing to fear-induced paralysis. We reached my abandoned truck just as darkness began its sly creep into every corner of our vision with weary limbs trembling from exhaustion and unnerving anticipation. We piled into the vehicle without exchanging any words. As I turned down a desolate dirt road in earnest departure from this wretched place, my heart clenched in the fretful silence. None of our group felt completely safe anymore. As we reported our nightmarish encounter to the authorities, a whirlwind of questions overtook the room. The officers seemed burdened with disbelief as we recounted our stories. However, the physical evidence of our torment was irrefutable, 
it seemed they couldn't ignore our plight entirely. The following days were filled with investigations, but no concrete answers were ever found. As if a specter, the man responsible for these heinous acts had left no trace behind vanished without a hint of his whereabouts or intentions. Eventually, life resumed some semblance of normalcy for us survivors. The throbbing pulse of fear that used to haunt us, although faded somewhat with time and distance from those dark woods, still lingered like an enduring shadow. The memory of those who perished at his hands and my lingering guilt over their loss etched themselves into my heart. Each anniversary of that chilling encounter marked by candles at our separate vigils spread across the country for we scattered upon our return to civilization, bound together by trauma but unable to face that terrible connection head-on. As for our invisible assailant— he remained shrouded in enigma the very reason behind his monstrous spree never uncovered. I'm haunted by the fact that whatever dark intentions brought about such pain may continue unchallenged by retribution so long as he remains free, while time slowly buries this dark experience in the shadowy recesses of my mind. An eerie vestige of horror refuses to be forgotten, as a shadow lives only when there is light nearby. I stepped out of my truck and took a deep breath, inhaling the scent of fresh pine as I entered the Jackson River wilderness in Virginia. My name is Marcus Kinsley, and I was not an avid hiker nor did I have extensive experience in wilderness survival. However, I felt drawn to the challenges that nature offers. Little did I know that the challenges I would face on this trip far exceeded anything I had predicted. During the first few hours, my excitement grew as I found a sense of solace in the solitary woods. The sun slowly vanished behind thick clouds, casting eerie shadows along my path. Unfazed, I continued deeper into the dense forest until I stumbled upon a small clearing. There, I met another hiker, Clara Winslow, who had stopped to rest her tired feet before carrying on her journey. After a brief pause, we decided to hike together for safety and companionship. As we pushed forward through rough terrain and increasingly ominous weather, Clara shared some hilarious tales from her college days stories that provided much-needed comic relief. As evening approached, we found ourselves near an abandoned cabin surrounded by large gnarled trees. It was then that we heard a blood-curdling scream from within that uninhabited structure. We rushed forward with concern for whoever might be in trouble but froze at the entranceway at what we saw next. Inside the dilapidated cabin lay a mutilated body with deep gashes covering every inch of skin exposed to our view. The barbaric scene forced us to reckon with our deepest fears as we knew that whatever caused such horror was certainly still lurking nearby. Clara reached for her phone to alert authorities, but there was no cell service in this remote area. Bravely gathering our resolve as we could not simply abandon this gruesome sight, Clara searched for any alternative ways to contact help while I kept watch outside. Upon realizing her own helplessness, Clara suggested that one of us should venture back out alone to find cell reception and call for assistance. We both knew there was danger in splitting up, but in the absence of any better alternatives, we made the tough decision. As Clara went her way, I vowed to protect the macabre scene so as not to risk contaminating any evidence. The forest canopy transformed into a thick blanket of darkness above me, and every snap in the bushes sent a shiver down my spine. Suddenly, I caught a glimpse of something moving in the shadows. It was massive and covered in matted black fur much like some grotesque hybrid of bear and wolf, but with elongated limbs and fearsome fangs that exuded an aura of pure primal dread. I struggled to keep my emotions contained as I locked my gaze with this terrifying creature. Inching backward cautiously, 
I recalled every possible self-defense tactic I knew from my limited time practicing martial arts. Sweat dripped down my face as the creature shifted its attention towards me. Even gunfire had certainly crossed my mind, but regrettably, I was only armed with a kitchen knife as we hadn't anticipated this level of danger. As fear gripped my chest tighter than any vice, the low growl resonating from the beast sent another rush of adrenaline coursing through my veins. In this moment, time appeared to slow substantially. Each breath felt deeper and more laborious than ever before. With no option left, I yelled for Clara, my voice echoing through the pitch-black woods. She didn't respond, but the beast's attention briefly wavered. A bleak realization dawned on me. Clara and I were too far apart for her to hear my screams over the eerie whispers of the wind. Slowly and quietly, I reached inside my pocket and pulled out my mobile phone. Its poor signal strength limited my options, but I did manage to send Clara a brief message. Run! The creature charged towards me and I avoided its massive paws by mere inches as it swiped at me violently. In a desperate attempt to elude the beast, I sprinted further into the forest with no sense of direction. My lungs bellowed for air, my heart punishing me with every step. From all sides, malicious trees seemed to reach out for me. I couldn't sustain this pace any longer. The predator relentlessly pursued me when unexpectedly— a park ranger appeared from behind a tree trunk, armed with a rifle. He fired warning shots into the air to drive the creature away. My legs finally gave way beneath me as I tried to make sense of the situation. Sheriff Thompson and his team soon arrived at the scene following repeated calls from us regarding disturbances in our area. As they examined our initial encounter site near the macabre scene we had stumbled across earlier, one deputy noticed something unusual, an ancient symbol carved on a tree stump by generations that had passed. Intrigued by its history potentially holding answers about our attacker's identity, I showed this symbol to a historian who eventually traced it back to an age-old European folktale about an infinitely resilient creature known as Stornyak one that had brought unrelenting chaos and misery throughout Eastern Europe during darker times. With all this newfound knowledge came goosebumps. Even now, recalling it all sends shivers down my spine. The creature's name, combined with the display of savagery we had experienced, struck fear deep within our hearts. I discussed this with Clara, who had received my message just in time to retreat to safety. While Sheriff Thompson had assured us he would patrol the woods until the creature was found, Clara and I made the reluctant decision to leave town. We couldn't bear the constant hair-raising presence of Stornyak looming over us. The townsfolk lost faith in ever conquering that malicious force and silently acknowledged that their lives would forever be irrevocably changed by it. As Clara and I drove away from that forsaken place— leaving behind the whispered echoes of forgotten tales seeping through the cracks of time as reminders of our darkest hours, we glanced in our rearview mirrors one last time. Tears blurred our vision as we grieved not only for those who succumbed to Stornyak's feral cruelty, but also for ourselves, eternally burdened by this unspoken nightmare. Leaving everything behind was painful. However, holding on to a shred of sanity was far more critical for us. As we carried on with our new lives, memories lurked like shadows in every waking moment. However, we remained forever grateful for the timely intervention of Sheriff Thompson's team and the park ranger who ultimately saved our lives. Years passed after that harrowing encounter, but Clara and I could never forget what happened that dark night in the woods. From time to time, revisiting the quiet whispers of folklore would haunt us once more, a reminder of how an ancient tale plagued us with lingering fears but also united all those touched by it. Despite it all, life moved forward day by day, and eventually, 
peace prevailed where nightmare once ruled. Finally free from Storniak's reign of terror over us and comforted knowing there were devoted people like Sheriff Thompson out there protecting townsfolk from the ever-looming evil, we continued to live our days one step at a time, confronting the monstrous shadows of our past, resilient as ever. I leaned against the counter, sipping the lukewarm coffee and listening to the gas station attendant regale me with local gossip. My name's Carter Fleming, and I had found myself in this tiny town due to some unfortunate car trouble. The boredom was palpable, but little did I know that my life was about to take an unexpected detour. The attendant, Hank Ribston, chattered on as his voice echoed through the near-empty station. Yeah, real crazy stuff going on out there, especially in that old abandoned house just outside of town, he mentioned offhandedly. I raised my eyebrow curiously. What's so strange about it? I asked him. The subject was far more interesting than learning about how Betsy's dog got out again. He leaned in closer before answering, lowering his voice to a conspiratorial level. Well, people have been disappearing around here for years, he said gravely. And every time someone disappears, there's usually a sighting of some creature. I couldn't help but grin at the sudden shift in tone. Hank was apparently a sucker for local legends. Nevertheless, curiosity piqued my interest further. Tell me more about this creature, I pressed on. He nervously glanced around before continuing, as if mere mention of the monster would summon it forth. It's a tall beast with long limbs, he elaborated slowly. Its body is covered in coarse hair or fur, and its eyes, they gleam like hellfire. Against my better judgment, I decided to humor him. After all, it was better than pondering my car issues and how much money they were going to cost me. So where is this abandoned house? I asked nonchalantly. Hank seemed hesitant at first but gave me its location, about half an hour away from our current spot. With nothing else to do and an unexpected thrill for adventure, I chose to venture out. A little sightseeing couldn't hurt, right? As I approached the dilapidated house, the sun began to dip towards the horizon. The house itself was barely standing, its timbers rotten and windows long shattered. Ivy had found its home on every conceivable surface. Darkness was beginning to encompass the woods surrounding me when a loud crash came from within, followed by a guttural growl. My heart skipped a beat as my skepticism raced into overdrive. Hello? I called out tentatively, thinking maybe someone had taken refuge there and possibly been injured. The silence that followed was deafening, but something urged me to investigate further. Slowly making my way inside through what remained of a door, the stench of dank rot overwhelmed me. My footsteps echoed in the eerie silence until they were interrupted by a low growl reverberating through the air panic began to settle in. This wasn't some scared animal or mischievous local playing pranks. The voice held malice I couldn't possibly imagine. I fumbled for my phone, deciding it would be best to call for help, but realized the battery had died hours ago. Initial panic escalated into raw terror as rationality fell by the wayside. I stumbled around in darkness, desperately looking for anything with which to defend myself or try to escape this nightmare. Each footstep carried me deeper into the decaying house, further from any hope of rescue or safety. Suddenly, a dim light flickered ahead, a stuttering candle flame left unattended. The room it illuminated seemed untouched by time, much unlike the decaying building around it. The bizarre sanctuary sent a chill down my spine, yet nothing could have prepared me for what awaited me next. 
A drawer lay open on an old dresser, and next to it, a handgun and an unfamiliar device emitting an unnerving humming noise. My heart raced as I reached for the weapon in a futile hope of evening the odds against whatever lurked in these shadows. Another growl echoed through the empty house, and this time, it was accompanied by the sound of something heavy being dragged across the splintered wooden floor. The chill in my spine spread down through my limbs, rendering me frozen in fear. Yet I managed to clutch the gun tightly. The dragging sound grew louder, and my hands trembled as I gripped the handgun. A guttural growl vibrated the decaying walls, signaling that whatever was making these sounds had entered the room. I held my breath, waiting for it to appear. A figure started to emerge from the darkness, its movements slow and menacing. The low light provided by the candle barely revealed any detail of its physical appearance. It had elongated limbs covered in dark matted fur, with razor-sharp talons at the end of each digit. Its face was a grotesque mix of animal and human features, with a large snout and rows of sharp teeth. My mind raced as I tried to make sense of what I was seeing, but nothing came to mind. My knowledge of folklore was limited, as it had never been an area of interest for me. However, this creature seemed to be something out of a scary story, something too horrifying to be real. I knew calling for help was useless with my dead phone and no phones in sight. My only chance would be to communicate with whatever this thing was in front of me. Trembling, I managed to utter a few words. Well, what are you? I stammered, trying to maintain eye contact with the beast. It paused for a moment and looked straight into my eyes before responding with a blood-curdling roar that shook the entire room. I knew there was no negotiating with this creature. It would kill me if given the chance. The fear surging through me loosened my grasp on the handgun, and it slipped from my hand onto the floor. In desperation, I reached for the strange humming device next to the handgun on the dresser, hoping it might be some sort of defense mechanism. As soon as my fingers touched its surface, the device emitted a high-pitched whine that pierced the air and apparently sent waves of pain through the creature. It howled and began to back away. Seizing the opportunity, I grabbed the handgun and bolted from the room. I could hear the creature's angry snarls and frustrated attempts to regain composure as the device continued to emit its piercing noise. I sprinted through the darkened house and back into the open air, never looking back. Days later, after recovering from my ordeal, I mustered up the courage to research information on the creature that had terrorized me. It turned out that the beast was a skinwalker a creature from the Native American Navajo folklore. The skinwalker was believed to be capable of turning into any animal they wished, making them nearly impossible to kill or identify. I'm still not sure who left that humming device and handgun in that mysterious room or why they did it. Had they known about the skinwalker and prepared a weapon capable of harming it? Or was it simply dumb luck that allowed me to survive my encounter? Nonetheless, my brush with death has forever shaken my perceptions of reality. I used to trust logic and reason above all else, but after encountering a monster straight out of folklore, some part of me will never be able to shake off that night. As for what happened afterward, I made it a point to get a new phone with better battery life immediately. The strange humming device sits on my bookshelf as a painful reminder of that horrifying experience. No one around me knows what happened during those days in the house, nor will they ever know. Some mysteries are better left unsolved. Due to my close encounter with the supernatural world that many would dismiss as mere tales and coincidences, I'm no longer a skeptic, but now someone who's aware there's more out there than meets our limited human perception. As for remembering those who've fallen victim to unknown creatures and horrors just like this one, 
I empathize with their families and loved ones left behind, carrying on brave faces despite the eerie undertones of mysteries and questions left unanswered. And still, life must go on. Despite all these revelations, we must pick up the pieces and move forward with our lives, remembering that there is more to the world than we can ever truly understand. It all started when I was visiting my cousin DeMarcus in a remote area of Montana. We planned a hiking trip to explore the untamed wilderness surrounding his cabin. As someone who grew up in the city, I knew it would be an exhilarating experience. We set out early on our journey, geared with warm clothes, a map, hiking boots, and a strong sense of adventure. We hiked for hours, enjoying the serene beauty of nature, tall trees, thick underbrush, and seemingly endless stretches of untouched land. DeMarcus chuckled as he shared some funny anecdotes about his past hiking adventures that were peculiar enough for us to wonder if they were true or made up. As we descended deeper into the forest, we stumbled upon a series of strange marks on the trees and the ground. Curious, we decided to follow these markings which led us towards a cave hidden by layers of brushwood. We couldn't resist taking a peek inside. It was dark and damp with an eerie must that I can't begin to describe. Hesitantly venturing further into the pitch-black cave, I could feel my heart racing as we switched on our flashlights. After walking for barely five minutes, we discovered something bizarre human remains scattered across the floor. Bones looked not on with teeth marks unlike any animal either of us ever came across. An overwhelming sense of dread washed over us as we hastily retraced our steps back to the entrance. Upon emerging from the cave, we encountered something neither of us could believe. There stood a nightmarish creature its tall lanky frame casting terrifyingly long shadows on the ground and elongated limbs appearing alien-like. The most unsettling feature was its head, resembling a deer or stag skull with sharp antlers that seemed ready to impale anything in their path. Gasping in shock, DeMarcus whispered my name while gesturing our line of sight towards the abomination. Isaiah, we need to leave. Now. I agreed and without any thought about calling for help since we knew no one else would be within miles, we slowly started to back away from the creature. To our horror, it began to approach us, revealing its true enormous size and terrifying form. Swift-footed by fear, we fled through the woods, desperately trying to make our way back home. The pounding of our feet on the forest floor was met by an equally disturbing sound of thuds accompanying every step made by the creature in pursuit. Suddenly, DeMarcus tripped over a fallen branch. Help! Isaiah! He shouted as he struggled to stand upright. I doubled back and pulled him up just in time to avoid falling victim to the monstrous creature. Continuing to sprint at breakneck speed through the forest, we tried to lose it amid the trees flitting past us, but it seemed it was relentless. Massive gashes marked trees next to us where we managed close encounters with those awful antlers. The deep cuts and splintered bark evidenced its destructive power and fueled our urgency. As we skidded around a bend in the path, DeMarcus yelled out angrily, Stop following us! Miraculously, his exclamation seemed to have some effect on the creature as it came to an abrupt halt just behind us, still far enough to leave a tiny bit of hope in our dwindling chances of survival. Panting heavily and hearts still pounding in our chests, we took it as an opportunity and continued our escape, while hoping that perhaps this horrific ordeal might end soon. As we ran further away from that nightmarish entity that had been haunting us relentlessly through the dark woods, I couldn't help but think about what could motivate such a beast. Was it merely hunger? Or did it enjoy hunting humans for sport? Unbeknownst to us, the creature began its pursuit again, 
and a feeling of impending doom gripped our minds as branches snapped under its immense weight behind us. Although our energy ebbed with each step, we had no choice but to continue running. Our legs ached, and our breathing became labored, but the thought of that creature catching up with us brought a newfound urgency to our flight. In a split-second decision, Demarcus grabbed my hand, pulling me off the path into a more dense area of the forest. The underbrush tugged at our clothes as we stumbled through. It was difficult to move quickly. The uneven terrain and darkness obscured our vision. Despite all this, Demarcus urged us forward. Why aren't we calling for help? I gasped, at the edge of my stamina. My phone dropped when that thing first caught sight of us. He panted in reply, voice strained from exertion. As I reached into my pocket, my heart sank. My phone was gone too, likely left behind in one of our earlier close encounters. Our breathing turned ragged as the reality of our situation set in. We were alone in these woods with an unidentifiable monster chasing after us. We halted behind a large tree, trying to regain some strength before pressing on. Our energy reserves were insufficient at best. It felt like there wasn't enough air in the world to fill my burning lungs. We had no idea whether moving deeper into the forest was helping or worsening our predicament. The abrupt sound of heavy breathing immediately put us back on high alert, and as we crept a short distance away from our hiding spot, we saw it. The creature stood erect, sniffing the air with that grotesque skull-like head. It was even more terrifying up close. Its long limbs seemed coiled like springs ready to release pent-up energy at any given moment. The antlers that adorned its skull gleamed menacingly in what little light penetrated the forest canopy. As if sensing our movement, it lunged toward Demarcus. In a last-ditch effort to protect him, I grabbed a fallen branch and swung it with everything I had. The creature shrieked in pain and stumbled, temporarily disoriented. Run! I screamed, grasping for Demarcus' hand and taking off again, forcing our exhausted bodies through the irregular terrain. With each step we took, the sounds of pursuit intensified. We could practically feel the creature hot on our heels, closing in with every passing moment. Its guttural snarls echoed through our ears as if it was right behind us. Finally breaking free of the thick undergrowth, we stumbled upon a busy highway, our salvation. With what remained of our strength, we launched ourselves onto the relative safety of the road just as headlights appeared in the distance. I waved my arms, desperate for driver's attention. To my relief, they stopped, the glare from their headlights preventing us from seeing their face. The car door opened, and as I glanced back one final time, the creature had halted at the forest's edge, its beady eyes gleaming hatefully beneath those twisted antlers. It seemed to know that it couldn't pursue us any further without risking exposure. Grabbing Demarcus once more, I climbed into the car, grateful for this stranger's intervention. As we left that place behind and sped down the darkened highway, the creature vanished into the night along with those chilling woods. Neither Demarcus nor I ever returned to that seemingly cursed place. And though we made no mention of folklore or myths surrounding such a beast, perhaps out of inherent fear or denial, there was no denying our shared experience or remorse for others who may not have been so fortunate. Though we evaded death that night, there would always remain a lingering awareness that somewhere out there lurked an unpredictable and lethal antagonist a frightening reminder of just how vulnerable even those who think themselves invincible can truly be. I just finished my shift when I got a call from Tobias Crenshaw, the town's mechanic. Officer Boonru gone. I found something on my property you need to come and see. Arriving at Tobias' property, I was stunned by the sight before me, a massive, 
twisted tree with a body hanging from it. The victim was Axel Fredericks, a loner who lived on the outskirts of Madley, Vermont. Tara Noonan, our paramedic, was inspecting the scene. What do you think? I asked her. Definitely murder, Tara responded with a grim tone. Some kind of rope-like device around his neck. As a small-town cop in Madley, I rarely encountered anything worse than petty theft. This chilling scene sent my heart racing. Tobias tugged at his overalls. You think it's like that movie about murderous creatures? He asked nervously. Don't you worry about that, Tob, I replied. We'll figure this out. Days went by as we searched for clues and questioned the townspeople to no avail. Then we received another call, this time from Tasha Sinclair from Madley Elementary School. A janitor named Vernon Quinton was brutally attacked, torn limb from limb in the school gymnasium. I remembered Vernon as my high school classmate who never left Madley after graduation, but his gruesome death painted an image nobody would forget. Boone, Mayor Winslow approached me nervously. The people are getting anxious. We need something done. I promise we're doing everything we can, I insisted. That evening, while patrolling Oakwood Cemetery, I came face to face with an unsettling creature. Its muscular form was covered in greenish-black scales and it had powerful jaws capable of tearing flesh with ease. I whipped out my gun as it unleashed a deafening roar before rapidly slithering away. I called for backup, but they arrived too late. This sinister new enemy continued terrorizing madly, leaving us to find more carnage in their wake. A telephone repairman eviscerated, a teacher's spine ripped from her torso. It was during a stakeout at Kingswood Park that things took a turn for the worse. Amber Hendricks, our clerk at the station and my close friend, volunteered to come along as backup. As we exchanged stories of Madley's past, scuffling sounds reached our ears. We followed them into a dense thicket to find the creature hunched over something, or someone. Amber couldn't hold back a choked gasp that gave away our position. The creature turned its horrible gaze on us. I fired my weapon, but it merely hissed in anger. Run! I shouted at Amber as the creature lunged toward us. We narrowly escaped back into the park where we'd come across another body, Yolanda Parkins, an accountant from City Hall. Mayor Winslow called for an emergency town meeting to deal with the crisis. Boone, we have to stop this monster before it destroys our town, he implored with panic in his eyes. My plans to trap the creature would require convincing every resident of Madley to work together. A nearly impossible task, but nonetheless, I had to try. We established perimeters around the town and set various traps, hoping one would catch our elusive adversary. Days went by without success while tensions rose among my neighbors. Even Amber lost confidence in me. Boon, she sighed one night. I don't know how much longer the townspeople can hold on. But despite all odds and despair reigning over Madley, I refused to give up. It was during another patrol near Tobias Crenshaw's property that an electrifying sensation shot through me, the sickening feeling of being hunted. In my peripheral vision, I spotted the creature creeping closer. With my heart pounding and adrenaline fueling me, I pulled out my gun and aimed. It was a showdown between a small-town cop and a monstrosity, an unlikely battle that would determine the fate of Madley. I took a deep breath and squeezed the trigger, releasing a bullet towards the creature. It screeched as the bullet grazed its tough, leathery hide. It paused for a moment, seemingly confused by the attack. I could see its large, yellow eyes locked onto mine staring with an intense malevolence. Its long arms extended, showing off claws that dripped with blood. I barely managed to dodge its swipe toward me, 
feeling the wind from the close call on my face. My gun now useless, I dropped it and yelled into my walkie-talkie for backup while sprinting further into Tobias Crenshaw's property. Backup needed immediately at Crenshaw's place. I gasped as I ran. In the distance, I saw Ember near one of our traps, a fallen log suspended above the ground by thick ropes. Seeing her brought me a new sense of urgency. We had to get this creature away from her. I needed to lead it away before it could harm her or anyone else and madly. The creature lumbered after me, gaining quickly on my position. As it approached Amber and the trap she was near, I yelled at her to release it. She looked up and nodded, quickly slicing through the ropes just as the creature arrived below the log. With a sickening thud, it struck the creature right on its head. For a moment, it appeared to have worked. The creature toppled over onto its back. However, our hopes were quickly dashed when we saw how little damage had been inflicted upon it. With an enraged howl, it got back to its feet and started tearing away at the other traps placed nearby. We had little time to hide before we heard sirens in the distance. Backup was arriving. The mayor had dispatched police officers to our location after hearing my call on their walkie-talkies. They exited their cars and joined our frantic fight against the beast, each officer shooting at it with their weapons. Yet despite their efforts, it seemed that bullets did little to harm the creature. Tobias Crenshaw, a local farmer and friend of mine, emerged from his house carrying a large hunting rifle. He aimed it directly at the creature and fired, striking it in one of its large eyes. This time, the creature finally screamed in pain before retreating into the woods. We all stood in shock and relief as it disappeared from sight. Our town had survived an attack by a vicious, seemingly indestructible monster. The thought of Yolanda Parkins and others who hadn't been so lucky weighed heavily on us. As we stood there catching our breath, the mayor approached me to give his gratitude. Boone, he said solemnly, you did everything you could for this town, and we are grateful for your leadership. For now, our nightmare was over. But deep down we knew that this creature was still lurking somewhere out there, waiting, watching. Until we uncovered its origins or found a way to stop it permanently, Madly would never be truly safe again. In the coming days and weeks, we focused on rebuilding our town and remembering those we had lost to the monster's rampage. In my search for answers about its origins or possible weaknesses, I contacted experts in both animal behavior and cryptozoology all around the world. However, none of them had ever seen or heard of such a beast as this one. Though we don't know when or if it will return to Madly again, one thing remains clear. Our once peaceful town has changed forever. We have been irrevocably scarred by what happened here. And like the gnarled claw marks left on Tobias Crenshaw's property, these emotional scars will be with us always. We all must be extra vigilant, watching the shadows, staying on alert and preparing for the possibility that one day the creature might return. But despite our fears, one thing still rings true. We faced down a monster and emerged alive. The ties that bind us as a community have grown stronger because of it. So we move forward, ready to defend our town and the people we love. No matter what horrors may stalk us in our darkest hours, we stand strong together against them. I'm Officer Nate Gavinsky, a small-town cop from Crestview, located in the picturesque state of Oregon. While we usually dealt with minor incidents, today was different. My shift started like any other. I cracked a joke with my partner, Lucy York something about shoe detectives always being at the scene of the crime. She chuckled and joined me on our usual patrol through the town. 
While chatting through the radio, we received a call from dispatch, a missing person's case down by Craven River. Our light-hearted mood quickly evaporated. Upon arrival, we found frantic family members searching for their daughter. They told us Tori Calvert, a college student home for break, had gone jogging this morning but never returned. We immediately launched a thorough search along the riverbank and found a disturbing scene buried within ferns and brush. Tori's violently shredded clothing and her abandoned phone was smashed screen. Further examination of the area revealed unnerving sets of large claw marks on nearby trees that indicated something powerful and unusual was at play here. A daunting realization washed over me. We were dealing with something far more sinister than what our little town was accustomed to or prepared for. Lucy called for backup as we tried to calm Tori's friends and family. After taking statements and gathering evidence, detectives took over the scene while we stayed behind to investigate. While discussing potential leads with neighboring woods, we stumbled upon disturbing noises echoing from the dark forest. Cries of pain and fear perforated the air as an unbelievable creature emerged from behind thick foliage. A beast resembling an enormous wolf unfathomable for this region yet it stood on its hind legs like a human. Lucy instinctively drew her firearm as terror filled both of our eyes when it charged us with great speed and unmatched aggression. Before she could fire any shots, it tore through my partner's arm leaving her unconscious and gravely injured. Backup lights flashed in the distance as the beast appeared to acknowledge the impending danger and retreated into the shadows. I desperately tried to stop the blood flow from Lucy's arm while calling for help over the radio. The responding officers found us, whisking her away to the hospital. As news spread about this monstrous creature— more stories of previous encounters began to surface from hesitant locals, detailing animal mutilations and other forest sightings. A horrifying pattern emerged which hinted at a possible connection to this terrible beast. This newfound realization shook our town's sense of safety and tranquility. At an emergency town meeting, I shared my own story growing up fatherless after my dad had encountered a similar creature during a hiking trip years ago. My father was never seen again, but I remained eternally grateful that he instilled in me a sense of duty and resilience in the face of fear. Determined to protect Crestview citizens, we organized search parties in an effort to hunt down the monster. We equipped ourselves with firearms and radios, exploring areas where it was frequently spotted lurking on its predatory hunts. During one late-night search near Craven River, I briefly saw its terrifying silhouette lurking on the outskirts of my flashlight range, illuminated by chilling moonlight before disappearing once again. The apprehensive whispers among our group grew louder, fueled by our mounting fear and uncertainty in confronting such terror. As we pressed on through dense foliage ahead, sounds of panic chatter echoed through our radios. Two more people had followed Tori's fate. Their disemboweled bodies were discovered under horrific circumstances behind their own homes, as if taunted by this heinous creature. While knowing that our attacker was nearby, we cautiously progressed deeper into the forest, signing ourselves potentially up for death or worse. Our nerves on edge as uncertain shadows shifted around us under gnarled trees housing unseen terrors. Our breaths grew ragged and desperate. We heard the chilling howls in the distance, one of my fellow searchers cracking a nervous joke about bad karaoke. Even while under the threat of death, we managed to find solace and levity as bonds of camaraderie formed from shared experience. Then— as we trekked through the darkened woods with adrenaline coursing through our veins, the creature's blood-curdling roar pierced the otherwise quiet night. In an instant, it leapt towards us with wide vermilion eyes fixed upon its next victims. 
We had expected to defend our fellow townspeople, but now we fought for our lives. With the creature pouncing on us, we scurried in all directions, desperately trying to dodge its vicious attacks. The forest erupted into chaos people tripped on exposed roots. Branches cracked under the force of our retreat. I sprinted away, seeking refuge behind a large tree and tried to catch my breath. Remembering my radio, I fumbled with it and called for help. My voice trembled as I spoke. P, please, someone respond. We need backup. That creature is attacking us. The static-filled response barely came through. Hold on. We're sending reinforcements. No sooner had I put the radio down than I heard a blood-curdling scream from my right. The creature had caught one of our searchers in an unrelenting grasp. I braced myself and rushed towards the poor man being dragged away by the creature. His body was enveloped by its grotesque form, dark, leathery skin stretched over a muscular frame, a snarling mouth filled with sharp teeth dripped saliva. Its hooked claws were deeply embedded in the man's flesh. Our eyes met fleetingly his widened in terror, mine stung as tears threatened to fall. We have to save him. A fellow searcher named Cindy yelled beside me. We shouted to rally our group and charged fearlessly towards the beast. The few flashlights still working cast eerie shadows upon its hideous features. Desperation seemed to grant us unnatural speed as we wanted so dearly to free our friend from that grotesque being's grasp. We grabbed at anything within our reach sticks or stones that were brutal enough to bash against or hurl at it with full force. Then the most dreaded sound emerged from the radio. Wait! Hold back! Our weapons aren't effective against this thing! But our roaring adrenaline deafened us to reason. Furiously, we beat and kicked and clawed against its terrifying presence only for our makeshift weapons to shatter into splinters like glass. Exasperated and overpowered, I glanced around helplessly, feeling defeated. I knew calling for reinforcements was the only logical choice. My finger quivered over the radio button as the creature, still clutching the man within its merciless claws, advanced towards me with pouncing desperation. The onslaught of reinforcements arrived in a thunderous storm of footsteps. Their heavy boots crashed upon earth, and their guns cut through the darkness with lethal lights. Yet even the searing impact of bullets couldn't hold back that monstrous being. They dragged the creatures captive away his muddied boots leaving streaks of red on damp earth behind them. Panting, I strained my eyes to see what became of our fellow searcher as that living nightmare spirited him away from our line of vision. The cacophony of roars receding into the night left an anguished echo in our hearts. Feigning valiance, we waited until dawn broke before returning to base empty-handed. We prepared solemnly to deliver the gruesome news of loss to whoever awaited back home. As much as we wanted to help Tori and now our fellow searcher, we feared for our lives. Upon reuniting closer to civilization, we hesitated to disclose any details regarding that ghastly creature's existence. We knew it would ignite untamable chaos in hearts already burdened with tragedy. We all agreed it was best if people never knew about this mysterious cryptid prowling their lands. During those uneasy coming days, we mourned our fallen brethren and planned quietly about how to watch over Craven River without drawing more people into harm's way. Soon word spread throughout town, whispers of a silent agreement amongst us searchers that no family deserved such heartache in these already dark times. We kept our suffering tightly bundled within so long as our town's children slept safely each night. As for the creature, it may hunt unseen by vulnerable prey, taunting us from those sinister shadows, but it would never claim victory over humans fighting for each other in camaraderie, bound together in light amid nature's darkness.
I woke up to the sound of footsteps down the hallway of my small apartment in Glendale, Arizona. My name is Walter Evanston, a middle-aged bachelor working as an accountant. Scratching my five o'clock shadow, I glanced at the time and frowned. It was way too early for any visitors. Slowly, I made my way toward the entrance and peeked through the keyhole. A woman wearing a stained white dress was shuffling past my door. Her movements seemed almost inhuman, disjointed, and slow. Suddenly she stopped in front of Frank's apartment next door. Frank was your typical old grump, lived by himself, and we barely spoke. The figure started pounding on his door despite frail arms that looked like they could snap any moment. With every knock, something seemed off about her skin texture like scales glittered subtly under the dim hallway light. There were only two apartments on this floor, and after it became evident that Frank wasn't answering his door, I began to wonder if it was wise to call for help. I retreated to my bedroom trying not to make noise as I grabbed the landline phone from my nightstand. Searching for any logical explanation, I dialed 911 discreetly so that she wouldn't hear me. When the operator responded, their voice was drowned out by a loud crash outside in the hallway. With sweat beating on my forehead, I hung up the phone and carefully walked back toward the entrance area to see what had happened. I gasped as I saw Frank's door smashed into pieces along with blood smeared across my apartment wall. Before I could process what had just happened, an ear-splitting scream echoed from Frank's apartment. The mixture of terror and pain made me shudder involuntarily. Slowly moving back into my apartment, I heard footsteps coming down the hall again. It was a police officer sent to check on us after my call. The man introduced himself as Officer Jeremiah Collins, and I began recounting all the strange events to him. Odd behavior, you say? A woman with scaled skin? he asked, raising an eyebrow and scribbling down notes. I nodded nervously, feeling foolish for not dialing 911 immediately. We decided to enter Frank's apartment carefully. The dark apartment was in disarray furniture overturned, and signs of a struggle everywhere. Searching cautiously, we found Frank's lifeless body lying on his bedroom floor by a smashed window. Horrified by the scene of gore and destruction, my legs nearly failed me. Officer Collins did his best to ease my fear with a joke. At least this isn't happening on a Monday, he quipped. Suddenly, Loud footsteps sounded from the fire escape outside the window. Peeking through the partially shattered glass, we caught glimpses of that scale-covered figure retreating quickly into the darkness below. Realizing quickly that something unnatural was at play here, Officer Collins withdrew his gun as we made our way through the apartment to access the fire escape from another adjoining room. Stay close. He advised as we lowered ourselves onto the fire escape and began descending cautiously toward the ground level. If we can corner her without letting her know we're right behind her. We continued our pursuit, navigating around the apartment complex in search of the creature. The psychological toll of the gruesome events had kept me from calling anyone else for help. Not knowing what this being was or if it was some sort of prank, I feared public ridicule if I implicated myself in any way, not to mention how further involvement could put others at risk. As we reached the ground level, we carefully surveyed our surroundings. The dimly lit alleyway provided little cover, and every sound seemed to echo ominously around us. Officer Collins motioned for us to split up and investigate two small adjacent alleys. With gun raised, I hesitantly took one route, while Officer Collins approached the other. I crept along cautiously, hands trembling in fear and anticipation. That's when I noticed a trail of fresh blood on the ground. It resembled what I saw earlier near Frank's lifeless body. Suddenly, 
Officer Collins' muffled screams pierced through the silence. They were abruptly cut short. My blood ran cold as I realized he was in grave danger or already dead. Panic-stricken but driven by a sense of obligation, I sprinted towards the sound of his struggle, only to find what was left of Officer Collins. His mauled and dismembered body sprawled across the pavement. The shock sent me sprawling back against the wall. My breath caught in my chest, and tears threatened to fall when I noticed the creature approaching me, the same reptilian figure with scale-covered skin glistening under the faint street lights. This horrible monster now stood before me, its elongated limbs ending in razor-sharp claws that dripped crimson onto the pavement below. Its eyes bore into mine with cold malevolence, as it bared its grotesque teeth. Somehow mustering courage despite my terror, I shakily raised my gun at it to defend myself knowing full well how futile an effort it might be. Suddenly it lunged at me. Instinctively, I dove out of the way and fired a shot, grazing the creature's shoulder. The creature emitted a blood-curdling screech of pain and fury as it quickly turned back to me now setting its sights on me with apparent determination to tear me limb from limb like Officer Collins. Surprisingly, the gunshot attracted the attention of several nearby residents who began to peer out windows or gather in doorways to see what was happening. The reptilian horror seemed aware of the growing crowd and hesitated in its pursuit of me. Perhaps it was uncertain whether to deal with this newfound obstacle or continue targeting me. The commotion also allowed me enough time to rapidly back away while keeping my gun aimed between the creature's eyes. In that moment, sirens started blaring in the distance. Backup was on its way, likely responding to the gunshots in the area. The creature appeared uneasy as if sensing that humans could pose a challenge en masse. With an unnerving snarl, it fled into a nearby sewer opening disappearing from sight just as several police cars raced into the area. The following days became a flurry of media coverage and investigations. Local authorities and federal agents scrutinized every detail. However, they found no conclusive proof of what had happened beyond victims' testimonies and scant evidence. Many speculated about some secretive government experiment gone wrong while others whispered about supernatural occurrences. Remembering that night still haunts my dreams, replaying visions of Frank's death and Officer Collins' gruesome end. They were good people who only tried to help during those horrifying moments, but instead paid for it with their lives. I am left only with speculation about what that cruel creature was an alien species hiding among us or some twisted experiment by our own government. What I do know is that this reptilian monster was anything but human. I still jump at the sound of strange noises in the night, and the urban legends that circulate through the city unnervingly bring back memories of that terrifying encounter. I never thought I'd find myself in the quiet town of Denville, New Jersey. I'm an accountant from Chicago, and my name is Horace Bartleby. My life had been predictable until my dear friend Wilbur vanished without a trace. So here I was, searching for answers. Denville had an eerie vibe as if the residents were hiding a dark secret. It was an unsettling thought but I needed to know what happened to Wilbur. A mutual acquaintance named Dolores Finnegan offered to assist and introduced me to a group of close-knit friends well-versed in the town's rumors. While discussing my concerns with Dolores and her friends, we discovered that people had been reported missing at an alarming rate. The locals whispered about a monstrous creature causing this nightmare, a reptilian ancient beast with razor-sharp teeth and dreadfully long claws. I remained skeptical about such folklore. Nevertheless, the truth remained elusive. 
Our conversation was interrupted by screams from down the street. My heart pounded as we dashed towards the source. The scene was beyond any rational explanation. A mutilated body lay strewn about on the ground meeting an unfortunate end. Although I found laughter inappropriate, one of the group nervously cracked a joke to dispel the rising tension. Did you know that alligators can grow up to fifteen feet? He stammered. But most only have four. Despite attempting humor, we felt the presence of real danger lurking in this once idyllic community. Piecing together snippets from witnesses, our focus honed in on a seldom-traveled path leading deep into Marcella Park's dense woods. Equipped with flashlights and courage, accompanied by Dolores and her fearless comrades, we advanced into the darkness unaware of what awaited us ahead. The deeper we ventured into the forest, our pessimistic whispers turned into familiar arguments and confessions of hidden feelings. Emotions were high when we stumbled across a mutilated deer carcass, possibly killed by something with immense strength and monstrous appetite. Stopping for a moment, I caught sight of a figure nearby. Its scales shimmered in the pale moonlight. It was the creature, just as described by frightened townspeople, reptilian but grotesque in form. And it was watching us intensely from the shadows. Fear overcame my skepticism as the realities of everything I'd heard became clear. Gunshots cracked through the night. One of Dolores' friends tried to eliminate the threat before it reached us, but the beast lunged onto him with horrifying speed, claws sinking deep into his flesh. He screamed in pain, and we panicked, scattering into different directions as chaos consumed our once united group. I felt a hand grabbing my arm. It was Dolores. We sprinted away from the nightmare unfolding behind us, adrenaline driving us further into the moonlit woods. Our only focus was survival, to escape from this horrific monstrosity stalking us relentlessly. Eventually, we stumbled upon an abandoned cabin that offered little more than a brief moment of respite. We could hear our pursuer's blood-curdling growl outside. It knew that we were trapped. Terrified and out of breath, Dolores and I exchanged glances as we prepared for our last stand against this reptilian abomination. Gripping a heavy iron rod with trembling hands, I braced myself for what seemed like our inevitable doom. As Dolores and I huddled in the corner of the cabin, the reptilian creature circled outside, making its presence known with sickening growls. Every inch of my body trembled. As much as I tried to prevent it, I couldn't contain my fear. Risking a glance at Dolores, I noticed she too was shaking. We need help, I whispered. We've got to call someone. My voice seemed to betray me, barely loud enough for even Dolores to hear. She nodded, agreeing with my decision, and pulled out her phone. But it was useless. There was no signal in this secluded area, and we were left to fend for ourselves. The creature continued its pursuit, slamming into the cabin's door repeatedly in an attempt to break through. The wooden timbers groaned under the immense force, and it wasn't long before cracks began forming around the hinges. We couldn't stay put any longer. We had to move or risk becoming prey for this monstrous being. Gathering what courage remained within us, Dolores and I darted from the cabin's back door and sprinted through the woods, hoping to find a way out of this nightmare. There was no distinct path ahead of us. We ran blindly through bushes and trees, desperately hoping our instincts would take us towards safety. It wasn't long before we heard a shriek echoing in the night. One of Dolores' friends still lived. Our hearts ached with guilt as we acknowledged their fate. This creature would not spare anyone left in its wrath. We couldn't give up now. We had to survive if only to honor their memories. Running side by side in terrified silence, we suddenly stumbled upon an open field just beyond the forest's edge. 
For a brief moment, we hesitated. There was nowhere left to run once we stepped into that open space. But listening carefully behind us, we realized the monster was still on our trail. It left us no choice. As we sprinted through the field towards civilization on the other side, the creature burst into view. It had caught up to us in an instant. Its reptilian features glimmered in the moonlight as its powerful legs carried it rapidly towards us. Its scaled body glistened, dangerously sharp claws poised for a fatal strike, while its muscular tail whipped back and forth, a deadly weapon in its own right. We have to split up, Dolores screamed suddenly. I hesitated for only a moment before nodding in agreement. We both knew that was our only chance to defeat this relentless pursuer. Dolores veered to the left, and I darted to the right, hoping against all odds that at least one of us would escape the creature's clutches. As I sprinted away, I heard Dolores' screams in my ears. Knowing that she had sacrificed herself so that I could live broke something inside me, but I couldn't stop running. There was just too much at stake now. Finally, I reached the outskirts of town where civilization provided some semblance of safety. The monstrosity had vanished. For how long, I couldn't know. But one thing was clear. Dolores' friends and Dolores herself were no longer in this world, murdered at the hands of a horrifying alien creature no one could have ever imagined to be real. Days have come and gone since that blood-stained night spent fleeing from a monstrous predator. The gruesome details are forever etched into my memory. People don't speak about what happened. They avoid discussing frightening tales and rumors about creatures like those. Our lives will never be as they were before. But one thing is certain. My every move is dedicated to commemorating those we lost while escaping from the nightmare that stalked us relentlessly that fateful evening. I remember the first time I set foot in Yosemite National Park. My name is Neil Drayton, and as an experienced hiker, I loved exploring new trails and discovering the wonders hidden within nature. My girlfriend, Julia Warren, had never visited Yosemite before and was eager to join me on this remarkable adventure. We agreed to embark on a week-long backpacking trip, immersing ourselves in the serene beauty surrounding us. Julia's amusing quirkiness kept my spirits lifted as we navigated the picturesque landscape. Day by day, our trek led us further into the national park. We stopped at various landmarks, including Half Dome and El Capitan, taking in their majesty while snapping countless photos. These are moments people dream about, feeling alive and connected with nature. On our fourth day out, Julia and I paused by a river to rest and refill our water bottles. As we relaxed on a large rock, we noticed a park ranger nearby named Owen Tillman. He approached us cautiously but with a friendly demeanor. Be cautious out here, he warned us. Just last month, there was a brutal mauling near this very spot. He explained that authorities still hadn't quite figured out what had caused it but they believed it was an animal of some kind. At first glance, Yosemite provided the perfect backdrop for our outdoor escapades, but now Owen's cautionary tale left us uneasy about what might lay deeper within the woods. That evening, as our campfire dimmed, thoughts of the unknown assailant made sleep difficult for both of us. The flicker of shadows against our tent played tricks on my restless mind as I scanned the darkness for signs of danger. The following morning offered little consolation. Julia discovered scrapes along her backpack, looking suspiciously like claw marks. This unnerving discovery put us on edge but made us even more determined to push forward towards our destination, Yosemite Village. As we continued on, we couldn't dismiss the subtle yet growing tension in the air. We started to encounter fewer hikers along the way, 
with many opting for alternative paths after hearing of the mysterious attacks. Now truly isolated and unsure of what we faced, Julia and I decided to spend our remaining two nights in a reserved cabin, hoping to retrieve some semblance of safety amidst the ominous forest. The cabin's rustic facade seemed welcoming as we approached it, yet somehow there was an edge of uneasiness still present. We spent the night attempting to lose ourselves in a game of cards, but were constantly distracted by every unfamiliar sound reverberating through the darkness outside our window. Our final day in Yosemite arrived with an eerie fog blanketing the landscape. As we prepared for our departure, Julia asked if it was worth trying to hike one last time before we left. Considering the circumstances, I hesitated initially but eventually conceded. We could stick to familiar paths and keep our eyes sharp along the way. Shortly after setting off into the misty morning, something caught my eye, tracks unlike any I'd ever seen before. The prints were long and slender with five distinct claws arching sharply around each paw mark. It was clear that whatever had made these tracks was no ordinary animal. Curiosity overcame caution as Julia and I decided to follow this enigmatic trail towards unknown danger. We soon stumbled upon a grisly scene where remnants of torn clothing lay strewn amongst thick underbrush. The chilling realization set in. This was evidence of another attack. It wasn't until the low growl resonated through the woods that my gut wrenched itself tight and my mouth dried up entirely. I dared not breathe or even move as fear gripped me like a vice. Inching its way forward out of the fog came a creature so fearsome, so horrifyingly monstrous that it defied all logic. The beast appeared to be a grotesque amalgamation of animal and human, stalking on all fours with matted hair and discolored, leathery skin. Its eyes bore an intelligent, malevolent glint as it studied us with ghastly intent. The creature's nostrils flared as it caught our scent. Julia and I exchanged wide-eyed glances, both of us aware of our precarious situation. In that instant, we knew we couldn't simply call for help and hope for the best. Our only viable option was to run. The beast snow morphed into a guttural roar as it lunged towards us. We bolted in opposite directions, hoping to confuse the creature. It hesitated momentarily before fixing its malevolent gaze on me and giving chase. I sprinted through the foggy woods, branches whipping against my face as I scrambled over fallen logs and rocks. The creature pursued me relentlessly, its thunderous footsteps and bestial growls drawing ever closer. I could feel the brutal intent behind every ounce of its fury. During my frantic escape, I stumbled into a clearing where two park rangers sat in their vehicle. They appeared to be on their lunch break and were startled when I barreled into their line of sight. As soon as they saw the terror in my eyes, both men leapt out of their seats and drew their firearms. I shouted at them to help Julia, barely managing to get her name out between labored breaths. They hesitated, hearing the approaching snarls and growls of the creature before locking their sights on it as it emerged from the fog. The rangers immediately fired their weapons at the monstrous being in an attempt to protect all of us from danger. The bullets seemed to have no effect on it. Even when struck directly by several rounds, the beast simply staggered back for a moment before renewing its attack with renewed ferocity. This had all escalated beyond anything any of us had prepared for. In hindsight, perhaps we should have contacted authorities sooner or fled entirely when we first encountered those strange tracks. But there was no time for such regrets now. Ranger Roy, the bullier of the two men, managed to radio for backup while firing his weapon. Minutes seemed to stretch into hours as he gave our location and explained the situation. Unfortunately, our harrowing ordeal took another tragic turn when the creature managed to close the distance on Ranger Jeff, sinking its five long claws deep into his torso and dragging him to the ground in a spray of gore. A split second later, a hail of bullets tore through the air from multiple directions. The creature reared back in pain as additional rangers who had been patrolling nearby converged on our location. 
outnumbered and injured, it finally retreated just deep enough into the fog that we could no longer see or hear it. As reinforcements arrived and secured the area, I stood with still raw horror washing over me. The rangers did their best to keep me calm, reassuring me that they would find Julia and provide her aid if required. They even managed to track down her location using satellite technology, an eerie indication of just how far removed we were from normality when confronted with an unknown beast like this. In one desperate final push for safety, it seemed as if we had narrowly escaped death, though at what cost? I mourned for Ranger Jeff's sudden and gruesome demise while holding on to hope that Julia would emerge unharmed. They eventually found her hiding in a cave, alive but shaken to her core. During our flight from the creature, she had miraculously managed to avoid crossing paths with it again, indeed a stroke of pure fortune amidst such chaos. The investigation that followed was thorough. Experts pored over every detail of our encounter but failed to find concrete evidence regarding what species this nightmarish beast could be. To us, it felt like something ripped straight from those dark corners of folklore where tales of vengeful spirits and beasts beyond explanation reside. Ranger Jeff was remembered for his bravery and sacrificial efforts to protect park visitors, while Julia and I did our best to move forward in life with this horrifying experience forever etched into our memories. Though the encounter left us scarred and changed, we couldn't have known how truly unprepared we were for this beast, one by which humanity had yet to identify. Such a reality forced us to concede that in this vast world, mysteries unspeakable still lurk within the shadows, hidden from our understanding. We could only hope that this malevolent creature would remain in the depths of Yosemite's foggy woods, far away from any future victims it might seek to terrorize. I was hiking in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park when I first encountered something I couldn't explain. My name is Milton Silvers, and I've always been drawn to nature, ever since my childhood days spent camping and exploring with my family. As an adult, I work as a wildlife photographer, so spending time in parks like this one is my bread and butter. The park itself is a magnificent landscape featuring lush forests, wildflower-filled meadows, and breathtaking waterfalls. Wildlife abounds here, with everything from black bears to elk roaming the dense vegetation. The trails are well-maintained, providing hikers of all skill levels ample opportunity to enjoy the beauty this place has to offer. On that fateful day, after miles of hiking through dense foliage, I stumbled upon a peculiar discovery, a weathered backpack resting against a tree trunk. Curiosity peaked. I opened it to find a set of keys and a crumpled map of the park with several circled locations. I considered turning it into the ranger's office before realizing that one of the circled spots was nearby. Little did I know that my curiosity would lead me on a sinister journey. The eerily abandoned campsite at the circled location resembled something out of a crime scene in overturned tent, scattered supplies, and what appeared to be dried blood on the ground. My instincts told me something terrible happened here but being too skeptical and shaken by what I'd found, I decided to carry on my hike instead of going to authorities right away. Further down the trail, I met another hiker named Clara Higgs who had witnessed unsettling events in the park recently. When pressed for details, she confided in me about her friend's disappearance weeks ago. Apparently, they'd come across hints suggesting something large and predatory was dwelling in this area. Odd claw marks on trees and mangled carcasses of animals found at different locations. Clara's friend went off to investigate and never returned, which left her devastated. To drown out my unease, I cracked some light-hearted jokes about being lost in the woods while Clara offered uneasy laughter in return. The rest of the day's hike was uneventful, and by nightfall, 
we decided to set up camp together for safety in numbers. In the depths of that night, we awoke to rustling sounds outside our tent. Fearful, we held our breath, waiting for whatever it was to pass. As the rustling grew louder and more frantic, we knew we had to protect ourselves. We nervously prepared whatever makeshift weapons we could find, a hiking pole and a hunting knife. Suddenly, a guttural growl echoed through the darkness. We froze before hearing heavy steps approaching our tent, each footfall crushing leaves with alarming force. It was clear that we were dealing with something much larger than an ordinary wild animal. Gathering courage, I unzipped our tent and peered out into the darkness. Illuminated by the dim light from our dying fire pit, I saw a monstrous creature unlike anything I've ever seen before standing like a man but with elongated limbs and covered in thick, matted fur. Its eyes glowered menacingly in the flickering light as sharp claws scraped against tree bark nearby. The terrifying beast tore apart our campsite with ease. Despite its viciousness, it never vocalized any recognizable sound besides its unearthly growls. We knew this monster had likely killed others who'd come into this park. It had no reservations for murder. Our minds raced as we began discussing our next course of action. How could we get help? Our phones had no reception in this remote area. How could such a thing even exist here? Questions kept emerging while fear blanketed us. Clara lifted her hunting knife in defiance as the creature began stalking towards us. If we don't do something now, we'll end up like my friend, she screamed. Knowing she was right, I grasped my hiking pole tightly and prepared to fight back. As the terrifying creature advanced toward us, I shouted at Clara to run to the car while I tried to distract it with my hiking pole. She hesitated for a moment, but then sprinted away, clutching her hunting knife. The beast snarled and shifted its focus to me, its eyes burning with rage. I swung my hiking pole at the creature, doing my best to hit its head. My blow connected, but it barely even flinched, instead lunging forward with a speed that belied its size. As the creature closed in on me, I did the only thing that came to mind. I threw myself off to one side, falling hard against a tree trunk. The monster's claws narrowly missed me as it lunged past. Seizing upon the stroke of luck, I scrambled back onto my feet and sprinted towards the car as well. Despite our best efforts to flee, the creature kept up with us easily. Even though its injured arm appeared hindered by my earlier assault, its powerful legs propelled it far too quickly. We could hear its heavy breathing as we desperately tried to gain ground on it. Just as we reached the car door and Clara began fumbling with her keys, we heard a frantic voice shouting from nearby. Tom, a park ranger who had known Clara for years, emerged from the tree lean holding a rifle. He spotted the creature bearing down on us and wasted no time aiming his weapon before firing two shots. The bullets connected. One struck it in what appeared to be ribs while the other hit an elongated shoulder-like structure near its neck. With a howl of pain and anger, it retreated hastily into the woods. Tom rushed over to secure our safety asking if we were all right as he scanned our surroundings for any sign of the creature returning. We assured him that we were physically fine but deeply shaken by what had just happened. While Clara struggled to start the car, I asked Tom why he had been in the area. He explained that several reports had come in regarding strange and frightening occurrences within this part of the park. Tom had decided to investigate them personally, choosing to patrol the area around our campsite due to its proximity to the reported events. As we drove back towards civilization, leaving whatever monstrous creature we had encountered behind us, Tom relayed some information about local folklore, specifically a creature called the Wendigo. According to tales passed down through generations, 
A Wendigo was once a human who succumbed to cannibalism and transformed into a monstrous beast. The description he provided sounded eerily similar to the creature that attacked us. Arriving back at Clara's house, we decompressed from our harrowing experience. We debated whether or not there was anything we could do in response to our encounter. Going public with our story seemed unwise, as did returning to hunt down the creature on our own. We realized that contacting the authorities would likely result in our claims being dismissed, especially since we lacked any irrefutable evidence in support of our statements. Distressed but pragmatic, we decided on a plan of action. For the immediate future, we would avoid returning to that area and warn others against doing so as well. Tom agreed to inform his colleagues about what he had seen and experienced but recognized that doing so might damage his credibility with his peers. While I believe we did everything we could have reasonably done to prevent more incidents like ours from occurring, I can't deny that thoughts of future victims haunt me. I remind myself that it's impossible to say for certain whether anyone else will ever encounter that same terrible beast or even if such creatures exist in other parts of the world where local legends may be similarly founded. But I still occasionally find myself reflecting on those nightmarish moments. Even though it may seem near impossible that such creatures truly exist, our experience remains a sobering reminder of the unsettling nature of reality and the limits of our understanding. And as much as I try to push it out of my mind, I can't shake the chilling memory, the grotesque form of that creature from folklore. I'm Vincent, and this all started in the dense forest of Aokigahara, Japan. Our task force's mission was to locate any unidentified monsters living there. We specialize in hunting and tracking these beings, but none of our cases compared to what we encountered during that secret mission. My colleagues Mitch, Skyler, and Josette were with me. While we were used to living on the edge, this day felt unnerving, like it was playing host to something unknown. Not long after our arrival, we found a mutilated body that triggered our curiosity more than the usual sightings. The disarray resembled an art of violence, bones protruding from the skin at unnatural angles and clothing torn to shreds. We investigated further into the woods when Josette's voice cracked over the radio, her alarm evident as she gasped about another corpse she'd found. This time, it seemed like something had fed on its insides, leaving gaunt remnants behind. The horror took a new form. We'd never seen anything like it before. Tension ran high as the sun dipped behind the trees casting eerie shadows on the ground. Skylar muttered next to me. According to local legends, some animalistic beast is supposed to live here. I cut him off, reminding him not to be superstitious. However, I have to admit that his research impacted my mind when I noticed how unnaturally quiet the woods around us had become. As dusk morphed into darkness, we stayed vigilant for any creature hiding in plain sight. That's when it happened, a deafening growl pierced through the still air like an unsettling siren call. Anxiety rippled through us as we frantically looked for cover. What was that? Mitch demanded aloud while grasping his knife firmly. Suddenly, a large creature came into focus, bigger than any wild animal we'd ever encountered, characterized by scaly skin, horns, and an elongated face with multiple rows of razor-like teeth. Its eyes were like empty pools, a void that felt endless and terrifying. We exchanged glances, our hearts pounding in unison, as Mitch whispered, Call for backup. But every attempt was futile. Our communication seemed to have fatally failed. We couldn't ignore the fact that whatever this creature was, we were on our own now. The grotesque being and its disheveled hair reeked of rotting flesh. 
as it sneered menacingly at us, my mind wandered back to my days of living alone, grappling with my inner demons. But nothing could compare to the horrifying reality in front of me. Feeling cornered and vulnerable, we reacted on impulse. I shot at the creature as my team reached for their guns in unison too. A metallic symphony tore through the silence, bullets whizzing past us like impatient raindrops. However, they seemed to have no effect on the beast. Instead, it only fueled its monstrous wrath. It lunged forward with tremendous speed that should have been impossible for its size. With lethal force, it clawed into Skylar's face. A blood-curdling scream tore from his throat. We managed to drag him away from the predator but knew he never survived the brutal damage inflicted upon him. Despair set in as we retreated further into the forest. I couldn't help wonder who else would die before we stopped this abomination. In all my years working or leading these missions, I had never faced such perilous terror that didn't submit even in the face of deadly gunfire. Headlights pierced through the darkness ahead as we stumbled upon an abandoned vehicle amidst the trees, evidence of other lives once lost to this nefarious enemy. Suddenly, there it was again. The creature pounced out from behind the car, leaving scratch marks so deep in the bodywork that the metal shrieked in response. We blocked its path and braced for impact. With no time to waste, I yelled to my team. We have to keep moving. This monster won't stop. We sprinted through the dark forest, adrenaline pumping through our veins, pursued by the relentless beast. I spared a glance back to see its grotesque form closing in on us. It was a hairless creature with sharp teeth and long, twisted limbs that scraped the ground as it lurched forward. As we ran, I couldn't help but berate myself for not calling for backup earlier. Our radios had stopped working the moment the creature appeared, leaving us isolated and alone in hostile territory. It's as if it knew, knew just how vulnerable we'd be without any outside support. The creature let out a guttural roar that sent chills down my spine. I could sense its anger and frustration at not being able to catch us yet. It was getting closer now. I could hear its heavy breathing gaining on us with each passing second. We need to find higher ground. We can't outrun this thing, shouted one of my teammates. Like divine intervention, we stumbled upon a small cliff with a narrow path leading to the top. With desperate haste, we scrambled up the steep incline, some slipping on loose rocks but managing a steady pace nonetheless. Once atop the plateau, our hearts pounded against our chests like thunder in a storm. Our lungs burned, but there was no time to recover. We had to devise a plan to stall or deter this monstrous predator. My gaze fell upon our surroundings, spotting some rocks and debris littered across the area. An idea quickly formed in my mind. Help me gather these rocks, I instructed my team. We'll have to try and buy ourselves some time. As they piled up heavy stones nearby, the creature could be heard growing nearer. It would make its ascent any second now. Sweat dripped from brows in anticipation, while our hands tightened around the rocks we chose as makeshift weapons. We formed a defensive circle, waiting until the creature was in sight. Seconds felt like hours as we prepared for the imminent showdown. The beast lunged forward, emerging onto the plateau with ferocity that matched its grotesque appearance. But we were ready. On my signal, we all hurled our rocks at the creature with all our strength. Several hit their mark, momentarily stunning it. Desperate, we continued throwing anything available, branches, lumps of dirt, keeping distance between us and it. In a stroke of luck, one rock struck the creature directly between its eyes. A piercing howl erupted from it as it staggered back and slipping on loose rocks by the cliff's edge. Taking our chance, we pinned it down using more large rocks that lay scattered nearby, 
hoping to buy us time to escape or figure out what to do with this abomination. Its enraged screams echoed throughout the forest, making my ears ring and threatening to break my resolve under its weight. Despite this, I couldn't help but wonder, what was this creature? Why did bullets have no effect on it? We need to go, said one of my teammates, snapping me back to reality. That thing won't be trapped for long. We have to get help. We carefully climbed down from the cliffside, leaving the immobilized beast behind. Pausing only for a brief moment of silence for Skylar, gone too soon in our battle against this malevolent entity, we rushed to find our way back to safety. Hours later, exhausted and haunted by the horrors we'd witnessed, we made our way to civilization and reported the incident to authorities. After providing detailed accounts about the creature's features and behavior as well descriptions of where our unthinkable encounter occurred, they responded with a quiet intensity that left us even more unnerved. In the coming days, the beast would be discovered, captured and held under strict containment, classified as an unknown, but now subdued threat. However, the knowledge that such a menacing entity existed left an indelible mark on my psyche. The world felt more dangerous than it had before our fateful mission. As I lay in bed, my dreams were plagued with images of the creature, its twisted limbs, jagged teeth, and unrelenting pursuit. The nightmares served as a constant reminder that somewhere out there, hidden within the shadows of the unknown, we had met and survived true horror's true incarnation. I, Jasper Thompson, stood on the outskirts of the dense forest in the isolated town of North Bow, Oregon. Tall trees loomed over me, casting shadows that seemed to whisper sinister tales. Inhaling deeply, I studied the entrance to a driving path, barely visible among the shrubbery. As part of a specialized task force dedicated to hunting and tracking monsters, I was no stranger to fear and bloodshed. Up until now, across countless missions, nothing had managed to truly unsettle me. Yet tonight felt different. Ever since I was young, I found solace in forests like this. The greenery and silence were once my refuge from a family that never quite understood my fascination with all things strange and out of the ordinary. But something about tonight's mission seemed off from the start. You good, Jasper? My colleague Holden Clark called from behind me. He patted my shoulder as he walked past me toward the entrance. His scrawny frame seemed almost frail compared to mine. Yeah, I replied curtly, suppressing a shudder while attempting to crack a smile. I hope you manage not to trip over your loose laces. Hey, we've got our jokes for survival. He winked as he tied his laces tightly. The task force had been called in for Naomi Kendricks, a local mother whose child disappeared three days ago while playing near the forest. Sightings of an animal-like creature created panic throughout the community. We assumed it must be this creature that took the child. Listen up, everyone! yelled our leader Anna Langley from our group huddled around her blackboard. We are dealing with two priorities, rescuing the child or recovering the body, and capturing or eliminating the creature responsible as she detailed her plan while pointing at several points on our mission map, we listened attentively. Once briefed, we began equipping ourselves with specialized weaponry and tools to face the unknown threat. Our task force combed through the forest in a strategic formation. Holden had partnered with me, and together we walked further into the merciless darkness. Eerie silence enveloped us, broken only by the crunch of twigs beneath our boots and faint whispers over our communication devices. Suddenly, an ear-splitting scream cut through the air. 
Anna's voice crackled over our radios. Team 2, report. We picked up our pace and stumbled upon a grisly scene. Team member Isabel Stewart lay motionless on muddy ground, blood everywhere, limbs torn apart as if mauled by a ferocious beast. The entire team gathered at the sight, panic evident in everyone's eyes. Our mission had taken a nightmarish turn that none of us were truly prepared for. It was clear— this was no ordinary monster that lurked in these woods. We continued walking through the darkness, more cautiously now, tense as steel wires. Anna paused to assess an odd-looking trail of indents on the damp forest floor when I caught something in my peripheral vision. There, lurking behind a distant tree, I spotted a hazy figure whose silhouette seemed too twisted to be human or animal. Its monstrous features could not be mistaken, sharp claws replacing fingers and feet, grotesque patches of fur and scales covering its body. Its haunting eyes gleamed with menace. Before I could react or call for help, it slithered between shadows and vanished into the cold night air. In that fleeting moment I realized, our lives were not immune to danger while hunting these monsters. We teetered towards death with every step into their lairs. Trying to remain composed, I whispered into the radio. Guys, there's something out here with us. I saw something. The team exchanged concerned glances, but they didn't want to ignore a potential threat in the darkness. Anna nodded and made a quick decision. All right, we're going back to base. We need to regroup and figure out what we're up against. As we retreated towards our base camp, the unsettling feeling of being watched persisted. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. Everything about this creature screamed danger. Arriving at base camp, we scanned our surroundings for anything suspicious. Emma switched on powerful floodlights mounted on trucks to illuminate the area instantly banishing some of the shadows lurking around us. We should call for backup, suggested Ryan, visibly nervous. Anna considered it for a moment and replied, I don't want to draw more attention to ourselves. Whatever that thing is might be attracted by the commotion. We decided instead to fortify our temporary home setting up a perimeter of tripwires rigged with noise-making devices and motion-activated floodlights. Night turned into morning with no further incidents. Although exhausted by fear and an uneasy feeling that someone or something was stalking us, we persisted in our quest. It was crucial that we located this monstrous predator before it could strike again. While examining a damaged security camera further along the trail, its metal casing shredded as if mauled by massive claws, Emma gasped. She held up her phone, displaying an image captured moments before the camera's destruction. In terrifying detail, the creature revealed itself, distorted limbs sprouting twisted claws, gaping maw filled with jagged teeth, elongated snout crowned with bloodshot eyes that seemed infinite in their malice and intelligence. Visibly shaking from fear but knowing there could be no escape without facing this monster head-on, we spent the day scouring the area for any signs of its den or territory, hoping to find it before it found us. As night fell once more, we returned to our fortified base, only to discover something that chilled us to our very core. A motion-activated light placed near the perimeter was missing, and in its place lay a mutilated deer carcass. The message was clear. This creature was not only intelligent but also taunting us. Determined not to succumb to fear, we took turns guarding our camp, weapons at the ready. We hoped the creature would launch a brazen attack against us, where we would have the advantage. However, it seemed as if fate had different plans for us. Instead of a direct onslaught, the creature struck from the shadows. A blood-curdling scream echoed through camp as a team member disappeared into the dark abyss beyond our perimeter. Knowing time was of the essence, 
I gathered what remained of my courage and hesitantly approached Anna. We need to send out a distress signal. Now, conceding there were no other options left, she grabbed a flare gun from our supplies and fired it into the night sky. An eerie crimson glow illuminated our surroundings as we waited for help with bated breath. As if drawn by fear itself, heavy footsteps from an approaching search party soon joined the cacophony of chattering voices and barking dogs. Though concerned about potentially attracting more unwanted attention towards ourselves on arrival, Anna had called for backup. Their numbers might offer some protection against this abomination. Together with our reinforcements, we scanned the surrounding woods once more. No trace of either team members or our quarry could be found beyond pools of blood marking scenes of merciless carnage. The creature had vanished without a trace. Heading back toward base while pondering what transpired in these woods resulted in an epiphany. Perhaps this monster wasn't confined to cryptid legend but rather some horrific genetic abomination an unholy human-animal hybrid spawned from nefarious experiments on some secret, secluded laboratory. If correct, this revelation shocked dread into my very soul, but I can never be sure. As our weary search party finally neared home base, we cast weary gazes upon an apologetic dawn whose false hopes seemed tarnished by sinister shadow eagerly anticipating our next return. This happened to me a few years ago. At the time, I worked as a park ranger at a remote location called Hogs Creek Wilderness. Full of trees, chasms, and hidden caves, it was a place where people traveled to escape for a while. My name is Archibald Gently. Growing up surrounded by nature, I've always been drawn to the wild solitude of forests and mountains. That's why I became a park ranger. It felt like the most natural choice for me. I was on night patrol with my fellow ranger, Gideon Favreau, near one of the more popular hiking trails when we stumbled upon an abandoned campsite. The tents were torn apart, food scattered everywhere. It looked as if an animal had raided the camp. We decided to split up and search for any missing hikers. As I climbed higher into the hills, I found a trail of crushed underbrush leading towards an old, disused cabin. The bitterness in the air made me shiver involuntarily. When I reached the cabin, my flashlight flickered across one of its rotting walls. What struck me as odd was that instead of creaking under desperation like other abandoned structures, it seemed almost alive breathing heavy whispers through its decaying frame. A growl cut through the sudden silence. I could feel that something was behind me and turned slowly to see what it was, a huge creature resembling a bear but with twisted tusks and clawed feet like an eagle's talons. Frightened but compelled to hold my ground against this monstrosity from deep within the forest, I decided not to call for help lest it provoked immediate aggression from the creature. It let out a guttural growl as it started circling around me. I knew this wasn't just hunting prey. It had intelligent malice behind its eyes. Clenching my teeth anxiously at my own vulnerability, I tried recalling all the appropriate steps we learned during our training and occasional bear encounters. My radio beeped urgently signaling Gideon had found something too. Swallowing hard, I announced that I was in a tense situation and needed backup, but I feared it might already be too late. The creature lunged at me with frightening speed, claws outstretched, eyes glowing menacingly. I dodged by jumping to the side, my heart pounding in my chest. It twisted in midair and landed gracefully on its feet before preparing for another lethal strike. The creature's presence screamed imminent death, yet its morbid dance of attacks sent chills down my spine, as if it relished in playing with its food. Every sudden movement or noise terrified me as our deadly game persisted. 
where survival hung by a single breath. Somehow, amidst the chaos of evading this relentless predator, a joke from my childhood flickered through my mind. Why don't scientists trust atoms? Because they make up everything. The sudden thought provided some solace while I struggled to maintain control over my mounting fear. As the beast lunged once more, Gideon burst into the clearing, his gun raised. He fired three shots at the creature while screaming my name. The bullets seemingly phased through its ghostly appearance before sinking into the pitch-black night, with no apparent effect on our adversary. Its furious roar split the air, angered by our feeble resistance. Out of options, Gideon and I desperately ran now, hoping to lead it away from any unaware campers before devising a way to end this nightmare stalking amongst the trees. As we stumbled through the underbrush, I could hear its thunderous footsteps behind us, each one more menacing than the last. The fear and anticipation heightened with every heavy thud as we prayed it wouldn't catch up to us. I glanced at Gideon, my heart hammering in my chest, and we shared an understanding without exchanging words. We needed to call for help. Desperately reaching for my cell phone, I discovered that I had no signal deep in the woods. It seemed as though this beast was determined to isolate us from the rest of the world, a realization that only added to our terror. The creature continued to chase us through the dense forest, occasionally vanishing from sight only to reappear moments later, as if it was merely toying with us enjoying the torment it was inflicting. Its black skin glistened in the moonlight, making it nearly impossible to recognize any distinguishable features. The only prominent trait I could register was its monstrous size and the way its limbs seemed to quiver in anticipation before launching towards us. Laura, a fellow camper who had been wandering around the campgrounds alone when this nightmare began, suddenly appeared ahead of us, her eyes wide with terror and disbelief. It seemed that we weren't the monster's only potential victims tonight. Gideon! Laura cried out attempting to catch her breath. We need to get out of here. It's going to dash. Before she could finish her sentence, the creature lunged towards her with unbelievable speed and ferocity. Its large teeth sank into her neck as she let out a blood-curdling scream that would echo through me for years to come. Laura's final moments served as a bitter reminder of the stakes we were facing. There would be no second chances if that thing caught up to us. Summoning what was left of our strength and willpower, Gideon and I tore through the woods, desperately searching for an escape or any sign of civilization. To our utter relief, we finally stumbled upon a small town nestled among the trees, a glimmer of hope amidst our terror-filled ordeal. The beast roared in apparent frustration halting its pursuit as we approached the town. It seemed unwilling, or unable, to venture within the settlement's borders. We were momentarily safe, albeit with the terrible knowledge that the creature still lingered nearby. The town, it turned out, was home to Native Americans who were not only well-versed in traditional practices, but also aware of the unusual occurrences within and surrounding their land. They listened patiently as we recounted our harrowing encounter before one of the elders finally spoke. Your description suggests a skinwalker or perhaps a shapeshifter, he uttered softly. Such beings have existed among us for countless generations, stalking our people and feeding on our fears. Despite my lack of knowledge regarding folklore, meeting Laura's fate was not an option nor was being chased by an unknown monstrosity forever. Determination igniting within me as my mind raced for a solution, I asked the elder if there was any method to halt this relentless predator. With great trepidation, he shared his knowledge. These creatures could be diminished, if not eradicated entirely, by invoking sacred rituals and powders specific to their culture. Grasping desperately at any chance for survival, 
Gideon and I submitted ourselves to their guidance. The following days were filled with rituals and prayers, led by the tribe's spiritual leaders. Their unwavering concentration and dedication sparked courage within us as we faced our horrifying adversary. The night we confronted the creature once more felt nothing short of surreal, but armed with newly acquired knowledge and strength from our newfound allies, Gideon and I approached its lair with determination etched on our faces. As the ritual reached its conclusion, accompanied by the chanting of sacred words, a deafening roar pierced the night air, sending trembles throughout my body. I glimpsed wild-eyed terror in the creature's eyes before its pitch-black form disintegrated into nothingness. Relief, tainted by overwhelming sadness for Laura's tragic end, flooded over us. Laura would be forever remembered and mourned, a reminder of the price we paid in our pursuit of safety. The small town provided temporary refuge from the haunting memories that still lingered within the dark corners of my mind. Gideon and I felt eternally grateful for the kindness and wisdom bestowed upon us by the tribe who had saved our lives and helped vanquish a terrible evil. As our lives moved forward, we could only hope that our nightmare was truly over, never to rise again. This happened to me a while ago, before I opted for a secluded cabin retreat. My name is Soren Blackburn. Tucked away in the wild expanse of Orville Forest, North Dakota, my quiet refuge boasted luscious flora, crisp air, and vibrant sunsets. My only companions were squirrels and the occasional deer. For me, that isolation was just what I needed after losing my job as an architect. Sitting on the porch one evening, watching the sun dip below the horizon, Finnis Guthern joined me. My longtime friend and city accountant had desperately needed a break from number crunching. We exchanged stories about our mundane days before a chill sent us inside. Warmed by the crackling fireplace, we shared slices of freshly baked fruity pie. Suddenly, an unnatural silence filled the air. Even the fire seemed hushed. Phineas looked at me with concern etched on his face. Well, that's sad, he murmured. I nodded in agreement, and we headed outside to investigate. As we took slow steps into the night-blanketed woods, clouds hid stars that once blinked like far-off lighthouses against the velveteen sky. The stifling quiet continued, no creaking branches or rustling leaves. Everything was still. Finnis pulled out his phone to check if a weather warning had been issued but found no messages or signal at all. Perhaps it's dead zone? I suggested trying to rationalize the icy unease spreading through my being. While exploring further into the murkiness that swallowed us whole, we stumbled upon something with an acrid scent that made our stomachs do somersaults, an unrecognizable mass of gore and innards which Finnis accurately described as all sorts of messed up. Before we could process it further, we heard heavy breathing which painted pictures with its hushed resonance. Turning around, we saw a towering silhouette with grotesque proportions, an animalistic creature unlike anything we'd ever seen. This hulking beast's face belonged to a world beyond the confines of our imaginations, young, but leathery like ancient scrolls married to human flesh. Eyes were bottomless wells boring into my soul, and teeth, more suited to monstrous predators above mountainous roams. My instincts hollered for me to escape, but my legs seemed rooted in place by terror. Finnis whispered through chattering teeth that this had to be some animal on the loose or perhaps an elaborate and sick prank. I wished with every fiber of my being that he was right. But then the creature spoke. 
Its voice was a guttural cacophony of animal cries and human screams as it grotesquely muttered about dismembering us like its playthings of past generations. With each new syllable, the nightmare unfolded even further, a tableau of twisted limbs and dangling entrails cackling in the darkness. At this moment, my fight-or-flight instinct finally rattled awake, and we bolted back towards the cabin at breakneck speed. Finnis suggested calling 911, but before he could even finish his sentence, I held up my phone, not a single bar. Our only choice was to barricade ourselves and until morning when help would hopefully find us. We threw everything we could find, furniture, appliances and heavy logs, against the door and windows, trying to hold back the approaching wave of doom. Finnis and I huddled in the corner our eyes scanning the makeshift barriers we had constructed. The creature's laughter echoed through the trees outside, and the cabin trembled with every guttural rasp. Desperation flooded our minds as we scrambled to find anything else to fortify our defenses. I proposed that since the phone lines were down, perhaps radio would work and we could call for help via a nearby CB radio tower. Finnis agreed but his eyes held a flicker of doubt. Slowly, we approached the cabin storage room where I recalled seeing an old CB radio. Grabbing it, we tried to establish contact with anyone who might be listening. To our relief, a voice on the other line answered. Identifying himself as a park ranger, he asked about our predicament. Without going into too much detail about the culprit of our terror, I explained that we were being stalked and needed immediate assistance. His reassuring words triggered in us a slight glimmer of hope. He said he'd make his way towards our position as soon as possible. As hours passed in what seemed like an eternity, Finnis spotted lights in the distance through a tiny crack in our barricade. The rescue team was now approaching. Elation washed over us as we heard comforting voices coming closer. With these rescuers arriving soon, perhaps things would finally take a turn for the better. But no sooner had I entertained this thought than blood-curdling screams erupted from outside. The lights vanished almost instantly, and silence enveloped us once more. The realization that even specially trained individuals were no match for this monstrosity sent us back into our corners, our grip on sanity slipping away. As dawn broke, we emerged from hiding, the incessant laughter fading into an eerie silence. We made a final desperate plan, take a risk venturing out under daylight versus waiting for another devastating nightfall with that creature. With trepidation, we stepped outside, and it was then that I discovered the rescuer's vehicle shredded to pieces. Blood smeared the ground, but no bodies were found. The sinister reality dawned upon us. Whatever had attacked us showed an uncanny degree of cunning and intelligence. It didn't care for food or sustenance. It sought to instill terror in us relentlessly. What intrigued me most was the lack of remains. We suspected this creature had possibly killed before. Perhaps it had abilities, supernatural in origin? The idea was ludicrous but given what we'd experienced so far, I couldn't rule out anything. As we trekked through the woods, hungry, terrified, and utterly exhausted, Finnis suggested that I lead the way while he kept an eye on our six hoping to prevent another surprise encounter with the creature. After seemingly endless trekking and stopping at a nearby stream to hydrate ourselves, we finally found a town by dusk. Locals greeted us warily but offered help when they saw our disheveled state. Making their way to the cabin, local law enforcement discovered no trace of our visitors, human or otherwise. Though we couldn't prove anything, some residents whispered among themselves about legends of skinwalkers and shapeshifters haunting these woods for centuries. Incredulous as we were about folklore and mythology only days ago, Finnis and I weren't so sure now. We never saw the creature again, 
and maybe counts as good luck, it turned its unblinking gaze on someone else. The authorities eventually declared our friends MIA due to inconclusive evidence of the brutal killings we had described. But even years after that harrowing encounter in that cabin deep inside the forest, something still lingers deep within me, an irrepressible terror as I contemplate what kind of monster could have carried out those unspeakable acts, where, or when it might strike again. This happened to me eight years ago, at the Redwoods in California. My name's Malachi Greengrass, a forest worker tasked with preserving the area. I remember every chilling detail. My co-workers, Tegan Aleski and Roscoe Ironside, accompanied me on that fateful day. As we ventured deeper into the Redwoods, the three of us exchanged jokes and banter to pass the time. Neither of us expected the events that would unfold. Be careful with that chainsaw, Malachi, Roscoe remarked at one point. Last thing we need is a missing limb. I chuckled at his wit while Tegan snapped pictures of a fallen tree with her camera. She had a knack for capturing beauty in unexpected places. In that instant, we heard a blood-curdling scream nearby. It was Jackson Silversmith another fellow worker of ours who opted for solo patrol today. Tegan and I shared a panicked look while Roscoe dialed for help, but with no signal and miles away from the nearest station, we knew we had no choice but to investigate on our own. Following the sound of the screen, we found Jackson on the forest floor, his lifeless body lying eerily distorted with limbs bent at unnatural angles. Blood oozed from deep gashes on his skin, painting the earth an unsettling crimson. Tegan gasped in horror while Roscoe cursed under his breath. Either had encountered anything like this before. I tried to calm them down before deciding what to do next. Listen, guys, we've stumbled upon something far beyond our expertise. We'll head back for help immediately, but be cautious. Keep your eyes peeled for anything out of place. As we retraced our path back to safety, an impending dread crept upon us. The further we walked, the more my gut instinct hinted that Jackson's death was caused by sinister means rather than a freak accident. Suddenly, we heard a loud, guttural growling from the bushes, a sound no mortal creature could produce. Alarmed, Tegan tightened her grip on her camera while Roscoe and I positioned ourselves defensively. The creature slowly emerged and began to stalk towards us. I was shocked to see its grotesque form, large, muscular limbs, beastly claws for tearing through flesh, and an elongated snout filled with razor-sharp teeth. A thick coat of matted, dark fur covered its body. Roscoe managed to muster his bravery, and raised his rifle at the creature and fired a shot, but it only seemed to make it angrier. We were now face to face with a monstrous being hellbent on hunting us down. Driven by sheer terror, we broke into a frantic run to put some distance between us and the creature. As we darted through the thick foliage haphazardly, my mind raced to find any explanation as to why it targeted our team. Was it just after anyone who tread upon its territory or had it stalked us in cold blood? No time for answers as my thoughts were cut short by Tegan stumbling into Roscoe up ahead. They had spotted another mutilated body, this time belonging to our supervisor, Meredith O'Sullivan. My heart pounding, I quickly assessed the situation at hand. With two members of our team dead, it was imperative we call for help and alert search and rescue about the murderous creature, and fast. Without hesitation, I grabbed my satellite phone from my backpack that we carry for emergencies like this. Dial search and rescue, I told Tegan. My hands shook, 
making it difficult to dial the number as the creature's chilling growls echoed through the forest. As Roscoe guarded our position, rifle ready, Tegan urgently relayed our harrowing situation to search and rescue, who said a helicopter would be there in twenty minutes. Those minutes stretched on. We didn't dare move from our spot. The feeling of being hunted gripped our every muscle with tension. Finally, we could hear the faint buzz of helicopter blades cutting through the air, our signal that help was arriving. Come in for extraction! The pilot shouted through his speaker as the helicopter hovered above. We didn't waste a moment. Climbing into harnesses, we were pulled up to safety within seconds, but not before I noticed Roscoe had some scratches across his arm, the result of the creature's claw when he tried to save Meredith. Once aboard the helicopter, emergency medical personnel tended to Roscoe's injury while we desperately recounted everything that happened with Jackson and Meredith to search and rescue officers. The helicopter pilot navigated cautiously away from our location aware that any unforeseen movements could potentially catch that creature's attention again. Have you ever seen anything like this? A search and rescue officer asked me while examining photos Tegan had managed to take earlier during our terrifying encounter. No, I replied shakily, only able to mutter guesses on what it could be, an undiscovered species or a result of some freakish genetic experiment gone awry. Puzzling with fear and confusion over how the creature appeared so at home hunting its prey in the forest. Upon landing, we were debriefed by government officials and researchers who showed interest in both the sightings and our respective accounts of the gruesome creature. They sent us away soon after, urging us to keep quiet about the situation for further investigation. Everyone coped differently in the aftermath of our ordeal. Tegan submitted her photos and video recordings of the creature to a renowned biologist, hoping for an explanation. Roscoe, on the other hand, withdrew from his normal avid pursuit of outdoor adventures. As for myself, I could not get past the fear for those who might have crossed that monster's path since our encounter. The thought haunted me every waking moment. Was anyone else out there hurt or worse? Were they gone just like Jackson and Meredith? Months after that spine-chilling experience, rumors of maulings and mutilated remains popped up in the news. However, they never made any connection to what we'd seen because authorities refused to divulge any more information than necessary. Our lives changed unalterably after encountering that gruesome creature that showed no sign, nor intention, of mercy. We lost friends. We carry trauma with us. But fear paralyzes us into silence out of respect for Jackson and Meredith's memory. Every cruel growl on a windy night or unfamiliar rustling in the woods takes me back to that horrifying moment when our lives were altered forever, hoping that whatever secrets lay hidden in those shadows would never resurface again. But hope is a fragile thing when fear reigns supreme lingering on frayed edges, threatening to unravel countless lives entangled in its web. The terror etched into our memories serves as a constant reminder that some mysteries should be left buried beneath blood-stained leaves of despair, forever seeking solace in whispers lost amongst howling winds carrying with it the ghostly remnants of a macabre nightmare we hoped never to relive. This happened to me eight years ago, in Chattahoochee National Forest, Georgia. I was a forest worker named Jacob Flettner, a name not often heard. My partner in the forest department was James Spurlock. He handed out dad jokes like candy but liked to keep quiet in the woods. One day, we stumbled upon a disturbing scene, an odd arrangement of mutilated animal remains scattered across the ground. The hairs stood up on the back of my neck. Unsure of what could have caused this, 
We decided to report it but not mention it to others as we didn't want to cause unnecessary panic. Over time, similar incidents occurred where we found more gruesome remains. James and I monitored these events closely, noticing that they seemed to align with our maintenance checks around the forest's cabins. One day, while on one such check at an isolated cabin near Rock Creek, another forest worker named Lisa Krieger joined us. She was an experienced tracker and said she had seen similar signs throughout her career but never in this volume. As we approached the cabin, apprehensive conversations filled the air. James cracked a joke about how the antagonist was probably just a creature with bad taste and design. None of us could bring ourselves to believe him, especially when we discovered the horrifying sight inside, blood-covered walls and evidence of violence. Suddenly, something caught Lisa's eye, a trail leading away from the cabin. Following it cautiously, we found ourselves deep within the abyss of twisted trees and shadows cast by towering pines. It was then that we felt it a low growl reverberating through our bones and an unmistakable sense of being watched. As we continued tracking this terrifying entity using only our logic and intuition, no emotion involved, our understanding became clear. Whoever, or whatever, we were chasing was not human. It became evident that phones couldn't be relied upon for help as there was no reception this deep within the forest. Thus, we had no choice but to venture on. Silently communicating through hand gestures, we approached a large cave whose entrance consisted of twisted branches interlocking in a wicked pattern. That's when we caught our first glimpse of the creature, a hideous beast like a wolf but larger and more grotesque, its matted fur reeked of death and decay. Remembering my cherished family back home, my heart was heavy with fear of what would happen if this creature wasn't stopped. Someone had to put an end to its reign of terror. As we drew closer to the cave, Lisa went ahead to rescue the missing persons rumored to be held inside. James and I edged toward the entrance, ready for any signs of attack. Suddenly, the air grew cold. Could it have been just nerves? No time for distractions. The monster leapt out from the shadows. Its mangled form left us without question that this thing was tormenting our town. With guns drawn in preparation for this inevitable showdown, we fired at the creature without hesitation. To our horror, bullets seemed entirely ineffective against this infernal beast. It slashed at James brutally and dragged him inside the cave. The guttural howls joined the cacophony of pain resounding through those dark caverns. We could not lose James. We had spent years working together, and I knew his family well. Desperate for an alternate plan, I grabbed a concealed knife as I stormed into the labyrinthine cave. Horrified, I pursued the creature down the winding corridors of the cave, my heart pounding with each step. As I ran, it became painfully obvious that calling for help was futile. There was no way anyone would hear me in these depths. If we were to escape from this nightmare, I would have to rely on myself. Sharp turns led me further and further into the darkness until I stumbled upon a den filled with half-eaten carcasses of animals and, to my horror, human remains. The sight alone nearly made me wretch. I forced myself to remain focused on finding James. Then, among the horrifying remains, I spotted what appeared to be fresh blood. It pulled from a figure huddled in the corner. James! He was still alive but worse for wear. Moving urgently towards him while scanning for any signs of danger, I took note of how wounded he appeared with gashes covering his entire body. As I tried to assess the wounds and figure out a way to staunch the bleeding, James managed a weak smile through his pain and whispered that the creature had sustained an injury after its encounter with him. A spark of hope ignited within as I realized that this monstrous thing could be hurt. 
Recalling my concealed knife and its potential usefulness against the beast, James alerted me of its return. The creature's looming presence filled the cave. It stalked towards us with determination, saliva dripping from its maw lined with razor-sharp teeth. With trembling hands grasping my knife and no other options left, I threw caution to the wind and lunged at the beast. The two of us tangled in a desperate dance of survival, its massive claws slashing through both air and flesh alike. Pain erupted across my arm as one of its swipes connected but didn't deter me from striking back. My blade finally found purchase in one of its many wounds that James had created earlier in his struggle. With all my strength, I thrust the knife deeper into the creature. It held in agony, reeling back which allowed me to drag James out of its lair. As we stumbled back through the twisting tunnels, the agonized cries continued to echo behind us. Our escape came at a great cost. As we finally breathed in fresh forest air, James collapsed to the ground. Slowing my breath, I began to analyze everything that had transpired. The creature's origin was still a mystery to me, but I had no desire to become an expert on it. My only hope was that my actions could provide enough safety for my town and perhaps allow it to pass into obscurity like a mere legend something they could recount around campfires without having to suffer its consequences. Help arrived just in time. Our injuries were tended to and everyone present marveled at our tale of terror and bravery. They mourned those who were lost due to the creature's existence, and swore never to venture into these woods again unprepared. James and I were hailed as town heroes but sought no praise nor reward. We were just thankful that we survived and hoped that our efforts would deter the creature from terrorizing our home ever again. The gruesome battle with the unknown beast we had faced became etched on our memories, eternally reminding us of both what horrors such reckless investigation could lead to and what strength exists within us when pushed beyond limits. As time moved forward, life resumed its normal pace. Families rebuilt lives ripped apart by this nightmare while sharing stories about their heroic plea for survival against an abomination beyond comprehension. Though fear remained among us all, somehow both resilience and a newfound appreciation for life were also born from the terror imposed by the unknown. In the end, even with countless accounts of horror and carnage marked by death and destruction on every side, becoming a small part of folklore proved preferable over unanswerable questions haunting generations from the shadows. I woke up with a pounding headache and glanced at the mirror to see a fresh bruise on my temple. Just another day in the life of Archibald Atkins, I muttered, trying to laugh off my frequent clumsiness. I'd recently moved to Hinton, West Virginia, a quiet town nestled along the New River. My job as an insurance claims adjuster had me traveling so living somewhere remote that was close to nature felt relaxing. Sometimes I missed living in the city, but overall, it was a welcome change. As I stepped onto the porch for some fresh air, I noticed our neighbor, Wallace Darnley, on his morning jog. Hey, Wally! I hollered as he waved back. It was a brief interaction, but Wally's genial nature made it feel warm. The sky was overcast like rain might pour any time soon. Deciding to enjoy some outdoor activity before the weather had other plans, I grabbed my running shoes and hit a nearby wooded trail. Plodding along at my usual pace, nothing impressive, I noticed peculiar tracks off the main path that splintered into the underbrush. Curiosity got its grip on me and despite my headache reminding me of yesterday's festivities, I veered from path to follow these mysterious tracks. Deeper into the woods I went, 
the more invested I grew in discovering where these large paw prints led me. The wet earth clung tightly to soles of my shoes making each step softer than the last. Before long, something caught my eye. A flash of red fabric tangled in a bush caught upon thorns. Though torn and bloodied, it appeared to be a scarf or shawl of some sort. Those inhospitable thoughts filled my every step as a growing anxiety weighed heavier than my headache had potential. After following this lead deeper into the woods than anticipated and finding questionable articles left behind by unknown hands, knotted rope and an abandoned backpack, my feeling of wrongdoing was morphing into a sinister plausibility. Suddenly, a guttural growl echoed through the trees, echoing deeper with menace as it fluttered above the wind. My heart pounded like a stampede forging through tight chest confines. I tried desperately to remain calm and logical, but I couldn't help making connections between the shredded red fabric and menacing chalk outlines which defined this wooded fortress. It was then that my eyes fell upon the monstrous beast that tore the air apart with its otherworldly roar. Standing on its hind legs, like a human, it somewhat resembled a giant wolf with vicious claws dripping bloodied crimson rivers onto damp earth to quench its morbid thirst. My mind shifted back into gear, and I thought about all the legends I'd heard in town about a humanoid creature stalking the woods. I shuddered in realization that the horror had found form. I moved clumsily towards the nearest tree, trying to shield myself from potential danger. As thoughts started hazily around my mind, I contemplated shouting for help, but would anyone hear me this far into the woods? Propelled by adrenaline and panic at finally laying eyes on this monster, I raced back towards safety, drenched in sweat mixed with fear's primal secretion. The beast snarled as it pursued my frantic retreat. My breath faltered, pace stuttered as branches tugged on torn limbs to halt escape. A pattern emerged, sprint forward only to be pushed back again, a jarring dance under beast's command. More mangled clothing soon revealed itself in limbs clenches, backpack straps and those fabrics whose vibrant colors once beamed before forceful submission turned beauty into pale forsaken shades of terror. In mid-stride came horror's cruel masterpiece, presently sprawled upon earth's footing taken for granted lay poor Wally Darnley, motionless, his life force drained away and twisted into a gory display. Mortality's crude lesson laid stark amongst fallen leaves beaten to earth's bitter surface in soiled contempt. My breath itched in fresh panic, the underscores of my heart breached the tempo bridges, each beat like drum hammering its cadence on the walls of turbulent rib cages with frenzied hashtag neighbor squeeze retracted in chilled seduction as though winter prematurely entered summer's yearning hold, grasping it all in a frosty embrace. Impelled by the visions of shredded clothing and the lifeless body of Wally Donnelly, I sprinted further, deeper into the forest, hoping to find a way out or someone who could help me. My heart pounded wildly in my chest as I could hear the creature following close behind me. Sticks and leaves crunched under its heavy footsteps, filling me with more terror. Eventually, my lungs burned for air and it became too much to bear. I had no choice but to stop. As much as I wanted to call for help, it felt futile. My cell phone lay shattered on the ground miles back. Even if it had to been destroyed, reception was non-existent in this remote location. I spotted a nearby tree with low-hanging branches and made a risky decision to climb up and hide in its foliage. Struggling up the trunk, I clung to branches like my life depended on it, because it did. The thought of what would happen if the beast caught up to me drove me further up the tree. As I hid among the leaves, my body shaking uncontrollably, the creature approached the base of my tree sanctuary. The distinct panting and ominous snarls filled my ears. It was so close now that every sense was heightened 
I could feel its presence like an oppressive cloud. Unable to leave that dense cover, I studied the monster from above. Although it resembled a massive wolf with dark fur matted in blood and dirt it wasn't an ordinary predator. It stood on two feet like we do and had arms equipped with razor-sharp claws that it used to tear into trees as if marking its territory. But its face was bone-chilling, a twisted arrangement of wolf-like features combined with human aspects. However, one couldn't miss its eyes those piercing red eyes were filled with malice and intelligence. Unsure if it knew about my hiding spot in the tree, I held my breath as long as possible to avoid giving myself away. I dare say it paused. Could it sense me above? I shuddered at the thought. Then, the horrifying creature unexpectedly retreated a few steps before taking off in another direction, seemingly without reason. It did not seem like it knew of my exact location but might have been thrown off by some other presence. Was there someone else here in these woods who inadvertently led the monster away from me? The idea was both comforting and horrifying. Stealing my resolve, I carefully climbed down from the tree. There was no time to waste. I had to take advantage of this opportunity and leave this dreadful place. Every sound the forest made seemed amplified now, each crack or rustle causing panic to surge through me again. Though luck seemed against me for most of my ordeal, I finally encountered a group of campers around nightfall. They were as shocked as they were relieved to find me. They had heard of Wally's disappearance and recognized me as his friend. "'Thank God you found us!' exclaimed one camper. Everyone gathered around as I recounted my harrowing experience, trying to keep my voice steady. Not surprisingly, they hardly believed what came out of my mouth. It sounded far too strange for reality. "'You mean you were chased by a werewolf?' one camper asked with a nervous chuckle. "'I don't know what it was.' I admitted, but that's what it seemed like. My God, murmured another camper, wide-eyed. As we walked back towards civilization, broken-hearted as we left Wally behind and our minds filled with grief and disbelief, we all agreed we would contact the authorities about his death and warn them about that monstrous creature lurking in the shadows. I knew in the end that whatever pursued me that dreadful day may never be discovered or believed but paying tribute to Wally and spreading the story would, at the very least, keep his memory alive. I'm Hank Emerson, a retired private investigator and now working as a handyman in my quaint little town of Grover's Mill, New Jersey. People around here often joke about the 1938 radio broadcast that convinced some folks space invaders were attacking. I'll laugh and jest, but my story is all too real and bone-chilling. One afternoon, after finishing up some work, I decided to take a walk through Willow Creek Forest Preserve a sprawling woodland area that stretches for miles. A gentle breeze rustled through the leaves above as I strolled along the trail, paying close attention to the vibrant colors of fall. Abruptly, I stumbled onto a gruesome scene, a torn-up campsite right on the edge of the trail. Shredded tents, scattered belongings, and traces of blood drenched in the soil painted disturbing images in my mind. Engulfed with a sense of duty to find out what caused this horrifying act, I began investigating. Asking around soon led me to meet Marla Johnson and Reverend Evans Blake, both locals from around the area who had become enthralled with odd occurrences happening over the past few months. They revealed tales of livestock mutilated and whispers about a monstrous humanoid creature lurking in the shadows. Piecing together accounts from locals and carefully observing my surroundings during nightly walks through the forest reserve, my skepticism gradually dissolved into concern. 
One night changed my life when I found myself face to face with the terror that words struggled to articulate. I was walking deeper into Willow Creek Forest Preserve than ever before. The sun dipped below the horizon and darkness fell like a curtain upon the trees. As moonlight seeped through breaks and leaves overhead, I suddenly heard it, a deep guttural growl from nearby. Turning slowly to face where the unsettling sound emanated from, my eyes barely made out an enormous figure propped against a tree trunk. Towering well over six feet tall, a wolf-like creature stood upon two legs, with its piercing yellow eyes radiating with something menacing. A thick, muscular body with coarse fur extended down to arms that clenched massive claws. The sight of this abomination drained all rational thought from me. I wanted to call out for help, but my voice couldn't rise above the pounding drumbeat of my heart. That's when the plot thickened. The creature lunged and savagely attacked a group of campers who had strayed off the main trail and set up their tents in an area we later found out not far from where the first gruesome incident unfolded. High-pitched screams tore through the night air as frantic people sprinted past me covered in deep gashes clawed across their limbs and torsos as if shredded by knives. Scattered belongings lay strewn about on blood-soaked grass illuminated by a flickering campfire. It was at that moment that Marla and Reverend Blake rushed into view, having heard commotion coming from a distance away. We quickly exchanged information on our previous investigation. As we caught our breaths and tried to piece together what we'd witnessed that night, we desperately attempted to dial 911, though reception failed us in these depths of the forest. Now understanding there was no reaching anyone beyond those trees for help, it slowly dawned on us it would be up to only ourselves to endure or confront this terrible monstrosity. We pressed onward, following the disarray of broken branches and trampled grass left by the creature's ferocious recent attack. The very ground seemed stained red from brutality that fateful evening as we pressed deeper into its lair. Determined to stop this beast once and for all, Marla clutched her phone tightly to her heart like a talisman, while Reverend Blake held a crucifix solemnly in his loosely shaking hands hope shimmering among us like a flame straining to stay alive against a relentless wind. Suddenly it was upon us again. Brazenly stepping into our midst, the towering wolf creature asserted its dominance with another monstrous snarl. Blood and saliva dripped from bared teeth as it eyed our group threateningly, seemingly taunting us as the very embodiment of everything we fear. Gathering our wits, we knew that standing still and waiting for the creature to attack was not an option. I yelled, We need to run! My voice cracked with fear, but there was no time for embarrassment. As we sprinted through the dark forest, tree branches whipping our faces, Marla gasped with every step, and Reverend Blake muttered a continuous prayer under his breath. We glanced back occasionally to check if the wolf-like creature was following us. Its yellow eyes seemed to pierce us like daggers. At one point, we reached a clearing where the moonlight shone brightly through the canopy above. Our race against time had depleted our energy, but stopping was not an option. Reverend Blake panted. We, we need to find some help somewhere. I nodded in agreement all of us knowing very well that it was easier said than done. The seclusion of the forest did not lend itself to immediate assistance or rescue. With limited options and no plan in mind, we continued running. As we trudged through the darkness, Marla noticed a cabin up ahead. We approached with cautious hope, praying for someone inside who could help us. I pounded on the door as Marla and Reverend Blake tried calling out for help once more, their voices pleading and trembling with fear. To our surprise and relief, the door creaked open to reveal a middle-aged man holding a shotgun across his chest. He took one look at our terror-stricken faces and waved us inside. We hurriedly scrambled into the cabin. 
After barricading the door with furniture as best as we could, the man introduced himself as John. He listened intently as we relayed our tale of the wolf-like creature that had so brutally attacked earlier. John's face grew pale with every word but offered us shelter for the night. With no better alternative available and sheer exhaustion taking over, we gratefully accepted his offer. Despite the tense atmosphere, our bodies demanded rest. We slept that night in shifts one guarding the barricade at all times while the other two dozed off. Reverend Blake awoke me from my turn at rest. I could see the stark fear in his eyes. The night had been eerily quiet until that moment. Suddenly, we heard heavy footsteps nearing the cabin. I tensed and grasped John's shotgun firmly knowing that my resolve would be put to the test. The wolf creature lunged at the door, snarling and clawing ferociously. Panic seared through us as the monster outside fought to break down the barricade we had constructed. Desperation set in as it shoved against the barrier, splintering wood with every surge. John glanced towards a back window and urged Marla and Reverend Blake to escape while they still could. They looked hesitant but complied as I prepared to take a shot if needed. As our companions made their way through the window, I held my breath and aimed the shotgun at the door. If it came down to it, I had no choice but to use whatever force necessary to survive. Suddenly, fortune favored us. Through cracks in the doorway, we could see flashing blue and red lights approaching rapidly. A gunshot rang from afar. A local hunter had found our distress signals from earlier that day. The deafening howl of the creature echoed through the night as it retreated into darkness, prompted by fear or perhaps an innate sense of self-preservation. John pulled me toward him and gave me a quick nod of approval before guiding me out of the now-ruined cabin. Reunited with Marla and Reverend Blake, we recounted our brush with death as authorities arrived on scene. In those brief moments, life had been reduced to its rawest form survival and still deeply within each of us, driving our every action. Although the wolf-like creature had vanished, the knowledge of its existence and our narrow escape from its clutches would forever remain, leaving a disconcerting reminder of the unknown dangers lurking within the depths of any forest. I've always been curious, and that curiosity had led me to some interesting places. Like the time I found myself in an abandoned, old rundown farmhouse on the outskirts of Syracuse, New York. I'm not proud to admit that I'm a bit of an urban explorer. My name is Jacob Cornelius, and I work as a customer service representative by day, but on the weekends, I sneak into creepy places others would rather avoid. Growing up in a small town with limited choices for entertainment often meant exploring old buildings for fun. Those explorations became a hobby during adulthood and brought me into several charming locations with dark histories. But the incident at that farmhouse still stays fresh in my mind. Must be your lucky day! My buddy Michael Baines joked as we arrived at the location. As we approached, I could smell decay and mildew in the air. The rotting wooden frame bowed under the weight of time and neglect. Let's go, Ethan Calloway urged enthusiastically. With my trusted crew beside me, including Sophie Warren, Ethan, and Michael, we pressed on. The moment we stepped inside... A strange stench hit our nostrils aggressively, a mix of dust and something else I couldn't quite figure out. What struck me as odd was how everything in the house looked relatively untouched yet aged as if no one had entered in years. As we walked past piles of old newspapers and faded photographs scattered across the floor, my curiosity grew stronger. Something about this place felt off. 
My mind started playing tricks on me as flickers of light appeared on the seemingly solid walls, making it feel like there were eyes on us. Naturally skeptical, I brushed it aside. Must be just shadows from outside, I muttered unconvincingly. Continuing down a narrow hallway adorned with peeling wallpaper, we heard creaky floorboards above our heads each step sounding more labored than the last. Should we go upstairs? Ethan suggested hesitantly. We all agreed with mutual nods. The house was so eerily quiet, allowing our footsteps to echo up the staircase. At the top, we discovered a room that defied logic. It looked as if it had been used recently. The bed appeared ruffled, and there was a peculiar musk in the air. Guys, check this out. Sophie called out from another room down the hall. Grimacing at the foul odor, we followed her voice and found ourselves in a terrifying space. An unimaginable sight awaited us. Sticky dark red substance covered the walls, and unwashed dishes full of an indescribable mold scattered around the room. It looked like someone had been experimenting with gruesome atrocities in here. We all held our breaths. My skepticism cracked as I tried to make sense of my surroundings when we heard a deep growl reverberating through the house. Our eyes wide with fear, we turned to find an abomination standing before us. A monstrous reptilian creature with razor-like scales and massive slit-like pupils eyed us hungrily. Before we could call for help or react at all, it lunged forward alarmingly fast toward Michael. Panic-stricken, I frantically searched my surroundings for any weapon I could grasp onto. An old rusty pipe sitting across the room caught my eye. As I sprinted toward it, Sophie screamed hysterically and seemed to freeze on the spot, not knowing what action to take. Meanwhile, Ethan struggled to pull Michael away from those menacing claws that sought to devour him. I sprinted towards the rusty pipe, my heart pounding in my chest. I grabbed it and swung it at the creature, hoping to give Michael a chance to escape. The pipe collided with the reptilian monster, but it only seemed to anger the vile beast more. It turned towards me and let out another vicious growl. Ethan and Michael managed to break free from its grasp, and we seized the opportunity to run for our lives. The reptilian creature chased after us, tearing the house apart as it pursued us relentlessly. We scrambled down the staircase and made our way towards the front door. As we sprinted to the door, I heard Sophie's voice in my mind. Call for help! but realized that our phones were left back in the room where we first discovered this gruesome scene. Our only hope was reaching safety before that monstrosity could catch up to us. We burst through the front door and into the open air. Panic set in as we realized there was nowhere near to run for cover. This isolated house stood alone in an open field. Momentarily catching our breaths, we decided that our best course of action would be to split up, making it harder for the creature to track us all down. I darted off on my own path as Ethan and Sophie ushered Michael in another direction. Their terrified screams filled the air as I distanced myself from them. My legs ached from exertion, but I couldn't spare a moment to rest or look back. That monstrosity was still after us. As I tore through an overgrown area nearby, I stumbled upon an old abandoned shed just barely visible between large trees and thick bushes. Hoping that temporarily hiding would be better than running aimlessly, I yanked open its creaky door and slipped inside. The air inside was stale, but I knew this temporary refuge wouldn't last long once the creature discovered my scent. I peered cautiously through a small crack in the shed's weathered walls, expecting to glimpse the reptilian monster making its way towards me at any moment. To my relief and despair, the creature reared its gruesome form into view but not on my trail. It had found Ethan, Sophie, and Michael. 
The nightmarish sight of their struggle made me sick to my stomach as I watched helplessly from afar. Ethan did his best to fend off the monster, but his onslaught was no match for its power and speed. In one swift swipe of its massive claws, he was struck down with a gut-wrenching crunch. I wanted to cry out for help, but doing so would only lead the creature to me. Sophie and Michael managed to escape once again as the vicious beast turned its attention to Ethan's lifeless body, tearing him apart in a frenzy of pure bloodlust. They continued running, but their chances seemed bleak against such a relentless predator. As I held back tears of anger and fear from witnessing Ethan's horrifying demise, I started searching the shed for something, anything, that could aid in our survival. I discovered an old flare gun hidden beneath various tools and discarded items. Though I knew deep down that it wouldn't be enough to defeat the creature, I gripped the flare gun tightly and left the shed to regroup with Sophie and Michael. Time was of the essence— we needed a plan. Reuniting with my terror-stricken friends, we held on to each other as we tried coming up with a strategy for survival despite our grief over losing Ethan. Michael suggested that since we couldn't confront this monstrous reptilian creature directly, apparently of an alien species unknown to us, our only hope was to find help beyond these isolated lands. We had to use anything possible— the flare gun for distraction and rusty pipes or branches as rudimentary weapons. With that, we summoned our remaining courage and ventured forth together, facing the seemingly insurmountable odds. We knew that the only way to make it through this living nightmare was to be more cunning and resourceful than the fierce predator stalking us. And so, our story of desperation continued, marked by bloodshed and the fierce will to live. It all started when I went out hunting in the woods near Spearfish, South Dakota. I'm known as Jake Holt, a regular guy who hunts when I'm not working as an HVAC technician. On my day off, it's nice to escape into nature, away from the monotony of daily life. During the hunt, I stumbled upon a strange scene, an empty campsite with signs of struggle. Belongings were strewn around and dried blood on the surrounding trees. I've seen enough detective shows to know that things weren't right here. Per souls, I muttered under my breath. Continuing cautiously through the quiet forest, rifle at the ready, I came across a trail of blood. My every instinct told me not to follow it but curiosity got the better of me. Tracking it deeper into the woods for what felt like miles, things took a sudden turn when I encountered a gruesome sight, another hunter torn to pieces. His head was missing, an odd detail that was hard to ignore. I need to call for backup, I whispered, taking out my radio and calling my friend Mike O'Neill. But there was no answer. Just static filled the airwaves as if something were interfering with the signal. This left me on edge but determined to make sense of these grisly discoveries. Following yet another trail leading further into the dense forest, I finally saw what had caused all this carnage, a creature unlike anything I'd ever dreamed possible, tall, strong and animalistic with shorter legs and an elongated torso resembling that of a human but covered in thick coarse hair like an ape. Its dark eyes appeared filled with pure malevolence. Hiding behind a tree at a distance, I tried to make sense of what I was witnessing while coming up with ideas on how to proceed without putting myself in immediate danger. Knowing that guns could be futile against such an abomination, frantically, I rummaged through my belongings hoping to find something that could help subdue the beast. The creature stared off unnervingly in my direction as if aware of my presence. My heart raced, panic seeping in. Shake, I reminded myself. It's never too late for a wisecrack. 
In an attempt to keep myself calm and grounded, I whispered, Hey there, Chewbacca from hell. Care to devour some carrots instead of people? Suddenly, the creature let out a blood-curdling scream and charged right towards me. My life flashing before my eyes, I took aim with my trusty rifle and fired a shot directly at the nightmarish thing. Instantly, its speed slowed just as it was about to collide with my hiding spot. Realizing its next attack couldn't be far off, my whole body urging me to flee, I made the decision to leave the gun behind and ran deeper into the seemingly endless woods. As I sprinted along an uneven dirt path covered in fallen leaves, a deafening howl echoed through the trees around me. The beast was in pursuit and getting closer. Just then, as if spurred by adrenaline or desperation, I activated a flare from my backpack tossing it into the underbrush hoping it would confuse the monster closing in. The distraction worked momentarily. The creature's steps faltered then changed course as the flare ignited into vibrant flames exposing it further. Massive teeth glistened hungrily while tattered clothes adorned its frightening form like bloody banners on an executioner's armor. Knowing that I couldn't outrun the creature forever, I devised a plan to save myself. The forest was dense and the trees grew close together, so I figured that if I could bind the creature with some of this fauna, I would have a better chance of escaping. As luck would have it, I stumbled upon a thick mass of tangled vines. I grabbed one and held tight as the creature continued to tear through the forest after me. With each step, my grip on the vine loosened and eventually slipped, causing me to fall to the ground in pain. By then, the monstrous creature had gained on me significantly. My only chance for survival was to lure it into my makeshift trap. With my heart pounding in my chest and every ounce of energy left within me, I stood my ground in front of the snarled vines. Come and get me, you ugly freak! I yelled at the top of my lungs. The beast roared in response and charged toward me with astonishing speed. As it began to reach out its arms for me, I lunged sideways toward a tree barely evading its grasp. The creature's momentum mounted against it when its massive body was entangled in the web of vines. As fate would have it, that wasn't enough to hold it back for long. In just a few moments, it would free itself from these bindings while examining me with wild fury in its eyes. But another miracle came, an echoing roar bellowed through the opposite side of the forest. The monster perked up its ears and undoubtedly recognized the call from another of its kind, one it seemed to fear even more than our current engagement warranted. Seizing this opportunity, I bolted into action again and prepared myself for an exhaustive sprint. This time around, however, considering its interference from afar kept my pursuer busy, some distance was finally rebuilding between us. I ran with everything left in my battered body. Within the safety of daylight, I spotted a small village up ahead, my eventual salvation. Upon reaching the outskirts of the village, I wasted no time in addressing its inhabitants about the abomination that pursued me. Though initially skeptical towards such narratives, the residents agreed to help when one of the older townspeople claimed to have witnessed something similar years ago. Everyone had doubted his recollections as delusions until now. With resoluteness coursing through us, we decided to notify local authorities about the creature that had invaded our territory. Meanwhile, our community eagerly facilitated my return to health and embraced me as one of their own. After an investigation was launched into the matter, some startling discoveries were made on what I can only assume to be this new species' origin. A nearby military laboratory had been performing experiments that involved a combination of gene splicing and radiology on various creatures, inadvertently triggering what became this grotesque monster in the process. Once authorities concluded their probe, 
they managed to apprehend the remaining beast still residing within proximity of that forest. Ultimately, necessary precautions were implemented forbidding further experimentation by the lab, ensuring no further creation or provocation of such abominations. All that said, there remains one lingering casualty from these gruesome events, Jake. The monster struck him down as it chased me out of our campsite. While I benefit from newfound friendships and now lead a significantly different existence away from those horrors, his absence forever mourned brings a chilling weight on my soul. Despite everything that happened, everyone I've met and lost throughout this harrowing ordeal reminds me that even when faced with unimaginable darkness and struggles against overwhelming adversaries, resilience and ingenuity can be the key to survival both for myself and those around me.